looking at the picture now the peloton and there is Bradley Wiggins moved right up on this little climb here and uh, I would say that Bradley might be thinking of helping Edouard Boysenhager today to try and drag him up for the spin because he's been helping him in the spin so far and Boysenhagen's had two third places in as many days. Yeah, he's turning out to be the, the revelation on the sprinting circuit. Certainly, he's a rider who we knew had great class, a lot of victories, 14 victories to his credit last year. What I did think was nice yesterday after the victory of Mark Cavendish was Brad Wiggins came up alongside him and uh, gave him a big hug of congratulations. Yeah. The two riders raced together for a long time uh, for Great Britain on the track, and they kind of had a, a rather a messy divorce after the Olympic Games in Beijing. Yeah. But I think they've put that all behind them now, and they've got back together again. Well, it's good if that has happened. As we're seeing the three leaders here, Perger has done himself no harm at all in the King of the Mountains composition, winning all three, could make it four. We just got the sprint, first of all, in Luzi, which takes us through the last 32 kilometres, and then we change departments and head down towards the finish. So one sprint lies ahead, then the last little climb, and then it's a race for home today, and it's going to be a pretty exciting finish. No, I think it will be an exciting finish. I do think we will have a, a massive big bunch sprint once again. And uh, obviously everybody will be trying to see whether or not they can beat Mark Cavendish, who is a great sprinter, but there are so many great sprinters in the tour this year. Edwell Bosenhagen is a guy we're not quite sure how he can handle himself. He's been very consistently near the front end of the main field, and he could prove to be the big surprise and the big revelation as a sprinter in this year's tour for Team Sky. Of course, Tyler Farah, we don't know how he's going to handle himself because he's still battling that little hairline crack in his elbow, but he's got two sprinters on his team who could also be pulled in as replacements. The Kiwi Julian Dean and the South African Robbie Hunter. Then you've got Robbie McEwen. We're not quite sure how Robbie is. He's uh, had a very nasty crash on the cobbles a little while back. Torhoshoft is always consistent. He's always there and thereabouts. And Oscar Freire is a guy who has been battling at the front end of the main field, I reckon, Phil, over the last couple of days to try and see whether or not he can get himself a stage victory too. Well, it's, uh, it's, I, I personally think Oscar Fur is a good choice for today. He's the sort of man that could do something here. But the finish itself is not up a hill, it's not downhill, it's dead straight. This is the Chateau de la Buissière in the department of uh, Semele, well, Department 58, but this is Semele where we are at the moment. And this chateau, by the way, is part of the, uh, part of the old... Um the old terrain of the Chateau de la Montagne as well is part of the same infrastructure. On that uh, site there, there was, a, there was a castle built way back in medieval times. All that res remains of the castle, in fact, are the footings that you can see in the garden. But that uh, house we're looking at there, in fact, is uh, part of the old fortress, and it was rebuilt in the 15th century. But it's all part of the same estate. There we are. It's not up for sale, by the way, so that wasn't a sales delivery by Paul. It's a lovely chateau, that one. Now, sharing things amongst yourselves here, the boys at the team of HTC Columbia. We're talking about Sifsoff being sent to the back. He's come to the front now with all the drinks. This is him on the left of our picture. Well, it was his turn to go down to the bar and bring on board the drinks, and that's important. As I said earlier, quite amazing that uh, one of the French riders uh, in, uh, in the race yesterday took on board 17 bottles, and those <laughs> bottles are around about a half a litre or a pint each. Yes, that's a lot of weight when I mean, you've got to carry it back up to the race. And it's not just a carrying, it's getting through the traffic jam to get to the front, where in the case of HTC Columbia, all of the team are riding right now. These are the three leaders. The gap is holding it just under two minutes as they head towards the village of Luzi. And it's been another long, long day in the saddle, breaking away four kilometres out today of a, of a stage of 227. It's locked now at the two-minute mark, and I think very shortly HTC would be very happy if one or two of the other teams came forward. And uh, yeah. I think as we get to around about 30 kilometres ago, I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple of riders come forward from Team Lamprey, the team of Alessandro Pataki. Pataki very much helped with his uh, stage victories by Danilo Hondo, the German rider who's on that squad. But a little bit caught out in the confusion of the sprint yesterday. Pataki needs to be launched to a sprint. He's not a chaotic sprinter like Robbie McEwen. McEwen is able to sit in the main field in fifth to tenth position and wait for all of a sudden for the door to open up in front of him give him the chance he'll steal it away from you beautiful day red hot here today and the riders looking pretty cool calm and collected from HTC doing what they talked about in the team bus this morning and that was to take control of the race if it looked as though the breakaway was not going to succeed and they're setting the tempo that matters now 
And they're just going to hold this as close as they can without catching for a while. We've got around about 20 kilometers to go to the final climb of the day. All the sprinters got over that last climb quite easily without any problem at all. But what they will be thinking about now is uh, whether or not they can survive on this uh, penal on this final climb of the day, the climb of the the Croix de l'Arbre, which is a difficult climb at two and a half kilometres long, and I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, a couple of guys in the main field trying to take advantage of that to try and force a small group off the front end of the pack. But what HTC Columbia will probably try and do as their tactic will be to keep the pace high enough uh, to try and discourage anybody from attacking off the front end of the main field. But from now to the finish, there's no such thing is any flatland it's completely undulating twisting and turning through this area now as we start to approach the Sonne Loire the final department of the day push off to, over on the left hand side he's uh, dropping back through the main field he's probably going back to the team car to have a quick chat with the management and uh, give him a checkup of exactly how he's feeling slipping back there the big man number 29 is Gregory Rast one of the team helpers of team Radio Shack also uh, slipping back there a fraction. I just noticed uh, Ryder Hazedal, who lies in fourth place overall, the Canadian. There's Lance Armstrong. Uh, he has uh, a different name on his bike every day, which is dedicated to somebody who's uh, struggling to uh, survive or recover from cancer. And that's part of the unity campaign. Some of the other riders in the team also are wearing names and dedications to people that, that they hope that will carry around the Tour de France this year with the hope to uh, increase and spread the word and the battle against that great curse of a disease called cancer. There you can see just to the left-hand side. Levi Leipheimer should be somewhere in the main field, apart from uh, the difficult day he had over the cobblestone stage into Arenberg. He's had a fairly quiet start to the tour. All that's going to change. This has all been pretty much shadow boxing so far. Once we start to get to, to tomorrow, we're going to see a different kind of rider. We're going to see the first uh, the first real uh, bullets flying in the Tour de France this year as we start to see the first pieces of tactics being laid out on the open road. Now joining the three leaders. They're starting to, to try, starting to lift the pace. They've been riding at a, a fairly constant average speed of 40 kilometers an hour, 25 miles an hour since the start, since they broke clear after just four kilometers of racing. And now they're probably going to try and lift it up to uh, 41, 42 kilometers an hour. It's a difficult thing to do, having been at the front of the race for such a long period of time. Push off now, coming back to the mechanic. Let's see what the problem is with Tor Hushoft. He's uh, the mechanics just having a quick look there. And he's just making sure that uh, everything's adjusted properly. And you can see, in fact, if you just look over to the left-hand side, there's a little lever on that brake uh, system at the back, and that's opened up. And that's probably because the uh, wheel at the back may well have been moving a little bit. It might have been slightly buckled, and Hushoff could feel it actually touching on the brake pads. Bit of a wobble on the old brakes there for Tor Hushoft at the moment. Uh, not what you need if you're going to have a big sprint finish and then need to slam on after you cross the finishing line. But it's better to have the problem now at uh, just inside of 30 kilometres to go than to have a problem at 10 kilometres to go, and that's why Tor Hushoft has taken this opportunity to go to the back end of the main field to make sure that everything is 100% with his machine and with his body before he runs into the final 20 kilometres, because then it's very difficult to drop back to the main field and get anything sorted out. Just over 31 miles an hour, the riders are speeding along at the moment. 38 kilometers still to ride to the finish, or about 23 miles. There it is, uh, he's racing his way back through the caravan here. Hush off now, resplendent in that green jersey. And he can start to think he should win a few more points today, because this race surely is going to come together now at a minute 37, where he's still a little way to go to the climb of the Croix de l'Arbre. And by then, it wouldn't surprise me to see Hushoft a lot further up the peloton here, and that's going to be important. Plushin wants a drink now, the champion of Moldova. So he seems satisfied now, Tor Hushoft, with the uh, information that he's got from the team uh, mechanic a little bit further back. There was a quick glimpse there of Mark Cavendish. There's Armstrong. Konstantin Sivstov is the rider just in front of us. He did a lot of pacemaking a couple of days ago. I think on the far side, I just caught a glimpse there also of Levi Leipheimer. 38 years of age, not the oldest man in the race, by the way. That honor lies on the shoulders of Christophe Moreau, the Frenchman on Team Case de Pagne. Armstrong riding his 13th Tour de France. And uh, his final one. The rumor has it 
that next year he wants to participate in the uh, Hawaiian Ironman. And uh, let's not forget that before the start of his cycling career, Armstrong, in fact, was a very successful triathlete. Well, at just okay. inside of 35 kilometers to go now, we're looking at a, a breakaway of three riders, still the same three riders at the front end of the race as Sebastian Lange, Ruben, Ruben Perez and Mathieu Perger with an advantage of a minute and 20 seconds. And if you weren't sure where we are, well, yes, it is still the Tour de France and it is still HTC Columbia on the front end of the main field who have done, I would have to say, probably 100% of the work over the last 40 kilometers of the race. A little bit of work going on on the left-hand side there as one of the riders from team Milram is uh, riding up the outside taking on board drinks to distribute them out to his uh, teammates and that's the former German champion Fabian Wegman nobody so far from the other teams and there are a lot of teams that do have sprinters on board have come up to the front end of the main field to do any of the pace making what they're trying to do is put a lot of pressure onto HTC Columbia but these guys will be motivated and I think by the fact that they know tomorrow it's not going to be their responsibility to chase down any breakaways because the next three stages on the open road will certainly not shoot Mark Cavendish at all or the sprinters because we slip into a different gear. We slip onto the small chain ring and climb up into the high spots of the mountains with two mountain top finishes, one on Saturday in the station of the ski resort of Les Rousses and then the day after that to Morzina Voriaz and then the next day into Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, the, well, the day after the rest day, I should say. That's when the, the big names are going to have to come out and play, and that's when I think we'll start to see the, the first uh, reorganization of the overall classification. And uh, depending on the race, how the race unfolds, you could well see an Australian take the overall lead because the, the best place of all of the pre-race favorites, of course, is Cadell Evans, who's just 39 seconds behind Fabian Cancellara at the start of today's stage in third place. So that's where we are. This is the town of Luzi. It just happens to be the town of jean Swap Bernard. There's the Spanish flag, and there'll be a lot of those Spanish flags out, I would say, over the weekend as well, because uh, the big uh, final of the World Cup, Holland versus Spain. It's very difficult to guess who is going to win that. There's the German champion just at the back there with the white jersey and the lime green helmet. That's uh, Christian Knies. And HTC have got themselves uh, no friends at all in this race. And they've adopted this tactic in so many of the races throughout the past where they've uh, had dominance. Well, they've got two dominant sprinters, actually. Not only is Mark Cavendish a good sprinter for HTC Columbia, but they also have another very good sprinter as well in Andre Greipel. But he didn't make the tour selection. So some are probably... Oh, it's at the top of the road there, Paul. The sprint point, the last one of the day here in Luzi. And again, I think we won't see anybody spin, and the one that won't go for it is at the back here, Perger, because he's taken all the mountain points, so he won't uh, upset the boys here by jumping away to win this one. It looks as though it's going to be Rubens Perez, followed by Sebastian Lang. Well, just as a point of interest, this is the hometown of Jean-Francois Bernard, Phil, and uh, he rode the Tour de France uh, a number of times between 1986 and 1995. But he actually won a very famous time trial of the slopes of the Mont Ventoux in 1987, where he uh, gave Stephen Roach a bit of a battering. He and he also won the final time trial of that year's uh, Tour de France as well, around Dijon. Absolutely did, and I remember Stephen Roach walking away from that finish in the time trial, and Mont Ventoux saying to me, he said, I didn't lose the Tour today, I still can win this Tour, and as we know, he went on to become the first ever winner, uh, first Irishman to win the Tour in 1987 nearest we've got onto the British Isles with a winner maybe this year Bradley Wiggins will go right to the top spot who knows well Wiggins has uh, been fairly good so far after a disappointing opening day prologue he rode exceptionally well through the days when we went down into the Ardennes and he defended himself admirably over the cobblestones as well yep Well, now we're uh, leaving the town of Luzi behind, and this is, uh, again, still in the Nievre so region, the departmental region of 58. Very shortly, we'll be changing and moving across into the next department, the final department of the day, the department of the saône loire And that is, of course, uh, the department... Oh, there's a crash at the back, and this is what happens when you don't pay attention. All of a sudden, there's a few guys go down, and this is uh, just a couple of touching of wheels as they went into town there. One of the riders who went down uh, quite quickly there, in fact, mm. was Lars Boom. Boom is a former time... well, current time to road cycle across champion. 
of uh, Holland, and he's been on the ground a couple of times. He has, and uh, because of it, he's near the back of the race at the moment. Christophe Kern, you may remember Lars Boom, is the first attack of this year's Tour de France has been left Rotterdam. It's Christophe Kern who is down there, with the crowd got double prize front money there for standing at the finish sign. Jeremy Hunt went There's down the there South as African well. flag flying there, Paul. That's for Robbie Hunter, I'm sure. Well, I'm certain it will be for Robbie Hunter. Hunter will be looking to maybe get his chance today if the team have sat down and uh, discussed between Tyler Farah, Julian Dean and Robbie Hunter as to which way they want to play the sprint here this afternoon. And Hunter, you know, we had a very big comeback the other day when uh, we saw him uh, charging up to the line to cross the line in fifth place. Now, this is our... Um the only Japanese cyclist in the race this year, Yuka Arashiro. Looks like he was caught up there as well. Yep, this is Lars Boom, cyclocross champion. He's been cyclocross champion of Holland since 2001, undefeated. He's also yeah. been world, world champion as well in that discipline. He came really to prominence this year. He's been a very good on the road with the Rabobank development squad, but he came to real prominence this year when he won the opening prologue of Paris-Nice and led the race for three days. A little bit of work required by those dropped riders to come back to the peloton because, as you see, there's no team cars around. They're blocked behind the fallers, but they should get back. Uh, they've got plenty of time on their side as it's only HTC doing the tempo. It's a shade over a minute, the gap now. Just looking way in the distance, the team cars are being held back, I think, by the race officials until the race itself sorts out. Well, Sebastian Minar looks like he went down in that crash yeah, as well on back. the left-hand side, and he's got himself uh, quickly back into the fold. But uh, again, that uh, just goes to uh, to prove the point that I always make, that when you want to ride the Tour de France, you have to ride in the front 15 to 20 places. That's the safest place to be. But not every rider has the nerve to do that, because you've got to bump shoulders, you've got to keep your hands away from the brakes. You touch your brakes, and if anybody sees that you might be slightly scared, all of a sudden you just get squeezed down the main field and very quickly you find yourself once again at the back of the pack. Lars Boom has done it. He's now uh, happily ensconced here. So he's got back pretty quickly. The peloton may have eased off just a fraction here, although the time indication they haven't. It's now hovering at 66, 67 seconds. Well, the same three riders have battled it out all day long from the fourth kilometre today. It's at the stage of the race where we wish they would succeed, but I think we've got to be honest with ourselves, they won't. They're inside a minute advantage now. There's one small climb to come of the Croix de l'Arbre. 23 kilometres from the end, we go over the top of that climb. It is going to be a tough call. The banner across the road indicating five kilometres to go and the South Africans out in force on the right along with the Scots here, all cheering David Miller, I'm sure. 25 kilometres to go. It's inside of the one-minute margin and I would have to say, Phil, I think the main field can probably see the prey that they've been looking for since the fourth kilometre and it was after just four kilometres that that three-man breakaway got themselves off the front end of the main field and they may well halve that minute advantage on the slopes of this climb as we start to get up to the point where the race then will be charging down towards the finish line and then I think finally we'll start to see some different teams come to the front and help with the pacemaking. Did I say five kilometres to go then? Bro? Oh dear, I was getting myself too excited. 25 to go, the gap is 51 seconds now on those three riders. A uh, pretty similar situation. We've got uh, Sipsov again at the front. He was supposed to do a little less work today for the team and recover from yesterday. But this youngster uh, just loves to race at the front and do the job for HTC Columbia. They're under that 25-kilometre banner now. Now, watch how the patterns are changing here because other teams are coming to the front as well, which I think we expected this year. These are the three leaders. little advice on the time check from the team car, but we're getting to the situation where the team cars are going to be pulled out now. 45 seconds the gap they'll be told by the race referees to leave the leaders shortly well that'll be the order that will go out we're now heading up to the uh, summit of the Côte de la Croix de l'Arbre and that uh, climb of 2.3 kilometers and already as they get onto the slopes of this climb you can start to see that the gap is uh, really beginning to plummet these guys will have had a hard time and they would they will have hoped 
to stay off the front end of the main field. They will have got a good amount of publicity time for their sponsors, which is an important thing in the sport of professional cycling because it's all about getting the name onto TV sometimes. But uh, the reason they've got into the breakaway was they hoped that maybe the main field wouldn't chase on a day like this. But I think because it's the last day of the sprinters for a long time, there is somebody trying to move on this climb. Perfect timing on this climb. Springboard and reach the leaders. And that is a great tactic. And then go for gold. It's not John Gadre, is it? Uh, it's a very good move here by uh, AG2R, trying to get themselves off the front end of this move. And in fact, the man going clear is uh, Dimitri yeah. Champion. He was a former French national champion. He lost that championship. And in fact, see, Phil, he's almost got himself halfway across the gap. Well, that is a perfectly timed move, and it's, it's when you've got to give it a go. They've probably seen him coming as well. As they've looked across, they've seen the whole peloton. They think, well, that's it. We're done for the day now. 20 seconds, the gap. Those cars behind have got to now leave the uh, peloton. Uh, because otherwise they'll bridge through the cars. So it's over for them. Perger wants the top of this climb. He wants to get all four climbs on the day and get all four uh, major points for the green jersey. So he's going to race as long as he can, but I've got a feeling that Champion is going to be up alongside them very shortly. Well, he's a, he's a great just rider. The corner there, he, yeah, he's just halfway. He's come straight the way across the cap. You can see the race referee there, the mobile referee with the uh, red shirt on there, trying to get everybody out of the gap. He wants to clear this gap as quickly as possible as Dimitri Champion is coming across. But you noticed in the main field, Phil, there was no reaction because the teams of the sprinters don't want to jump after Dimitri Champion. They're very happy to let one rider go clear, keep the main field together so they can organize the chase once they go over the summit of the climb. Well, this is a good move, and it was to be anticipated that somebody would try to bridge on the climb and then go for gold over the top. Perger just keeping his rhythm here, he's doing all the work on the climb, and the other boys are making it. Now, this is another rider attacking here. Anthony Chateau, former winner of the uh, Tour de Lancar, he moved back to a uh, French team. He rode for Case de Pagna for a couple of seasons in Spain, and now he's back on board with a French team at B Box at Boyga Telecom. But you notice the way the main field is reacting. They're allowing one rider at a time to go off the front end of the main field because they don't want the chaos in the pack. The teams of the sprinters are quite happy to let ones and twos go clear. They don't want a big split in the main field. They don't want to see 25 or 30 riders getting clear on the slopes of this climb. So Champion being chased by Chateau, three leaders still clear. Chateau, I think, though, has left it just a little bit too late because you see how quickly Champion got himself across the gap. Just over on the right-hand side there, that uh, black and white flag is the flag of Brittany. The Breton are very big supporters of the sport of professional cycling. No other major reaction in the main field as Champion has made the junction. He was in a breakaway a couple of days ago, and he is a, a very talented professional bike rider. He, he won the French National Championships when he was actually riding for a, a second division team, a team called Bretagne Schuller and uh, it was a big shock for the uh, big professional teams like uh, Boyd Telecom, AG2R, but he was actually snapped up very quickly by AG2R at the start of the season. But so far this year, he doesn't have a victory to his credit at all. 26 years of age, and uh, this is going to give some extra firepower to this leading group, but if you look at the gap, it really is uh, just hovering at the 34-second margin. And I think once we get over the summit of the climb, we'll start to see the teams of the sprinters taking a much more serious interest. Now there's the big sprint there, and Perger is looking to get himself at another three points. He's trying to make sure he's got himself maximum points at the top of this climb, and the reason for this is Perger is trying to get himself an extra three points. That'll give him a total of 12 on the day. Well, as one attack after the other comes now, Paul, this is yet again a good move here. Well, Perger, he points. jumps out of that to get himself another three points. That makes him three times four. That's 12 points on the day. He's going to be one point behind Jérôme Pinot in the overall classification. Mm. Now, that he will go out and fight for tomorrow. Good battle on the early climbs tomorrow. There's some small climbs before we get to the mountains. Anthony Chateau, this is. He's also got his way off the front of the group, and it looks like he's going to reach the leaders here. So we've got Perger in front, just he'll wait for them. Lang went over in second, Champion topped in third. And the fourth was Perez, and now we've got Chateau joining as well. Well, different teams. Different teams now coming up. Uh, the overall standings in the King of the Mountains tonight will be uh, Jérôme Pinot still leading that competition, Phil, by a single point from Perger. What a battle that's going to be tomorrow. Well, the agriculture, the farmers of France, they come out and they do it every year, don't they? And look at that, a map of France is shaped around those three beautiful animals down there, the Charolais, 
as they welcome the Tour de France in the region of the saint et loire and these are the men setting the pace, or the men setting the pace at the moment. They haven't caught Perger yet, but they're going to have to go off in pursuit of him. He hasn't waited for them over the top of the Croix de l'Arbe. Well, Perger uh, what jumped out of this group over the top to get himself the maximum points in the King of the Mountains classification. He's probably only just around the corner. This uh, firepower has been added to the early morning breakaway of three men, and fairly shortly I wouldn't be surprised to see them joining Perger. Then the five men are still only looking, Phil, an advantage of 30 seconds over the top. Well, they're going to have to work very hard to join Mathieu Perger because he has absolutely flown over the top of the Croix de l'Arbe today, and we can't find him at the moment, so I don't reckon they've got much chance. Welcome back. 17 and a half kilometers left to race. Mathieu Perger has the other four men in the breakaway and it's not going to be long before that breakaway is caught and the wind down to the sprint begins no more breaks now until the end of the race let's get back out onto the road and rejoin commentary with phil and paul they've been in the saddle now for five and a quarter hours and the same leaders virtually for that five and a quarter hours have been ahead they've been strengthened a little bit now by dimitri champion and anthony Chateau. Perger's back in the pack, he's back in the lead group rather. These boys feel they've got them, and so they're now not chasing them, they're holding them at 24 seconds. I notice Rabobank getting themselves organised, and maybe it's going to be the day for Oscar Freire, three times at champion of the world. Freire doesn't often battle at the front end in the big bunch sprints, but I noticed yesterday he was being fairly, uh, fairly vocal in mm -hmm. trying to keep his position at the first uh, four or five positions, so maybe he too will be looking for a win before we go into the mountains. Last chance for the sprint is Phil for a couple of days all the cars that were behind the leaders are now in front of them nobody's allowed in a gap when it sits at 27 seconds to half a minute and so if they do have a mechanical they'll be dropping back behind the race now but they should be okay these are good roads here and uh, wanting to really work this group through Dimitri Champion last year's champion of France lost his title the other week uh, and uh, to, uh, to Thomas Voigtler and now doing the work at the front. But you're right about Rabobank, Paul. They've got four men up here. They're uh, giving a bit of respite. That's Tony Martin uh, just on the right-hand side for HTC. Alexander Vinokurov in the turquoise. And once again, once we get to the, the critical parts on the running towards the finish, at Radio Shack move up to the front to look after Armstrong, Cloden and Levi Leipheimer. Yes, brought them all up on the right-hand side as we look at the picture here at the moment to keep them out of trouble because the peloton is really packing this road now. 25 seconds, they've prized out a little bit more, the race referee there riding in front of the riders. It looks as if they're riding on the back wheel of that car, but that's actually being foreshortened by the television camera lens. At Champion, what a great name for a professional bike rider, and what a great name for the former French national champion. Yeah. And he's certainly got the power. He's been in the breakaway already during the Tour de France, and he's looking for the breakaways for Team AG2R Le Mondial. Lost 19 minutes in the tour so far as it comes to the end of its first full week of racing and 700 miles, 1,200 kilometers. And uh, Anthony Chapteau won the Tour of Langkawi once in Malaysia. Changed teams, now he's back on the French team. He was on this team here, Case de Palm, which is Mathieu Perger's team right now. Well, just to add a, a little bit of an African flavour, the only uh, victories that Anthony Chateau has to his credit this year mm -hmm. were in the uh, Tropical Amisa Bongo, which happens to be in the western part of the African continent. He won the overall classification there, having taken the win on stage four. Oh, Gregor Bola, Bole rather, on the front now. And also Johan van Sommeren, uh, the big tall rider there in the orange helmet for uh, Garmin Transitions. They're obviously trying to fix something up for their man. So they've got themselves uh, pretty much organized. And uh, there you can see all over the front end of the main field, there is uh, a lot of teams trying to get themselves organized, a lot of teams trying to make sure that they're in the right place at the right time. 14.8 kilometers to go. HTC on the left hand side they are organized 15 kilometers to go the official banner there also up there getting organized was team Lamprey they're going to try and organize for their man this afternoon Alessandro Pataki looking to try and get himself stage victory number three so 
19 seconds is the gap. There are the five leaders being dragged along there by Dimitri Champion. The main field, I think, just waiting for the right moment to pounce. So, Anthony Chateau and Dimitri Champion, the riders doing the majority of the pacemaking. We're now just entering into the town of toulon sur aro and this is a very interesting town at around about 14 kilometers to go. These five riders, Phil, in the town of toulon sur aro are looking at about a 15-second advantage over the front end of the main field. So, so there's the arrows, this is the town, as Paul has said, toulon sur aro is... Uh, it's a pretty special town featured along the route today. These leaders are still away here at 12 seconds. The gap desperate moments yet again 13.8 kilometers. They haven't got a chance, but will they confuse the the way the sprinters are lining up their chasing teams? And that's another question Paul. champion has come up to this break with a purposeful move of trying to use that hill as the springboard. Uh, but it just isn't going to work. We're down to nine seconds. Down to nine seconds. It's a very pretty little village, this, Phil. They're in the village, and I'm not sure we'll have a chance to see them on the running towards the finish. There's a lot of old wooden houses and galleries, but this town is actually renowned for its very old bridge known as the Devil's Bridge. It's got 13 arches, and it dates back to 1145, although it was widened for the traffic of the modern era in the 19th century. Well, I'm not sure we're going over this. This looks like it's a bit too modern. But here we go as we start to say goodbye to this town. Uh, 15 seconds. The gap has gone up. And uh, that looks like it might be it, Paul. There's the arches under there. Underneath the arch, I'm not going to sing. Uh, 15 seconds to go. Uh, that's all the gap is now to bridge here. Champion clearly got the strong legs now as he's caught the riders who've been out in front all day. Boy, there's a traffic jam down there in this town, isn't there? There certainly is as they make their way around. Uh, number two there, David de la Fuente for Team Astana, one of the uh, henchmen for Alberto Contador in the mountains. He apparently was involved in a little bit of an accident earlier on in the stage, but it looks as if he's got himself safely back into the fold. Now, this tiny little village here with lots of uh, crosses and twists and turns will advantage the leading breakaway mm. because they can pick their line around those corners very easily on their own. As we've seen at the back in the main field, it creates a bit of a traffic jam once you have to negotiate these corners. Well, Champion has done so well there to try and keep this breakaway away. The other boys don't really find the strength to work with him. Chateau has. He's the rider that came across to the group last. But the clock is saying they're not getting away at all. They're being pegged out at 10 seconds. And when the sprinters do catch up and the team start to organise it, then the pace is going to shoot up as well. There they are, all massing behind this little group of leaders. Well, 10 seconds uh, is uh, pretty much all that they've got, and that corresponds to around about 200 metres advantage. There on the front in the yellow jersey is the man who leads this race, Fabian Cancellara. A little bit of traffic uh, furniture there in the road. Signals going out. You might have seen some of the riders lifting their arms up. Well, that's to indicate to the riders behind them that there is danger on the route as Dimitri Champion has really got the bit between the teeth here this afternoon. Little flick of the wrist there, that's the indication to Chateau. Come on, keep the pressure up, let's keep working here because as long as we're off the front end of the main field, we're still in with a chance of creating the surprise. Chateau comes up to the front now and he is per quite prepared to set the pacemaking while the main field have got these guys in their sights all the time at 100 metres. Well, it's a bit of a tricky one, this. It's rather like the great British horse race, the Derby, both sides of the course, as the riders uh, try to hold position, always difficult, and now here's the coming back and togetherness again. Well, in the main field, uh, all of the jerseys, the yellow jersey, polka dot jersey, white jersey, green jersey, they're all in the main peloton looking for 15 seconds. That corresponds to 250 metres. The main field are just hovering there, but Dimitri Champion, Phil, Take your hat off to that man because he's yeah. not going to give up. He's not going to lay down his arms until he's got the main field right on his back wheel. The peloton are being driven with a little bit of help from Radio Shack as well, but Dimitri the Champion is not coming off the front of that league group. Desperate moments for the breakaway, but look, we're approaching 10 kilometres to go now, and they're going to have to do something about this. The only good news is it's not a difficult approach to the finish, and that relationship, I'm afraid, isn't what we want to see if you're in the breakaway. Well, a lot of these guys are really starting to uh, push up the pressure a little bit. Uh, Michael Rogers, his uh, heart rate monitor is pushing his heart rate quite high up to around about 160 beats a minute. But more importantly, he's generating pretty close to 400 watts. Now, that's an indication the pressure is starting to come on in this field. 
The Norwegian flag flies for the God of Thunder, Tor Hushoft, who wears the green jersey. He needs points today to keep building because tomorrow and the next day isn't going to favour these boys. We're going into the high mountains by Sunday. Well, Dimitri Champion, and that's what he is, a champion today, is leading them under 10 kilometres to go, and that's just about where they're going to be caught. And that is about four kilometres earlier than the past two days. But we're all together again. Well, Phil, as they say in Italian bike racing, that is Gruppo Compacto, and that's the first time it's been Gruppo Compacto, a group all together, since the fourth kilometre of the race. Uh, Radio Shack on the front end of the main field. Quick rundown on the finish, Phil. It is a fairly safe finish, as you just mentioned. Uh, from the three kilometres to go to one kilometre to go, it's a very long, straight boulevard. It's the main road, in fact, that goes all the way through town. Then, at a kilometre to go, there's a little traffic circle, which is not too dangerous, and then inside of 750, 50 meters to go there's a sweeping left hand bend and it's straight run at the finish line it should be a great one for the sprinters this afternoon this giant of a man on the front here from radio shack gregory rast when he gets to the front you can hardly see the peloton anymore he's absolutely huge looks like david miller has moved up to the front for garmin transitioned on the left hand side this is the first stage of the softness julian dean i think it is tracking him in second wheel so they're looking i think today to try and help the south african robbie hunter get the stage win lance armstrong dead center looking around at who's coming up ivan basso's coming up what's going on here paul these aren't the guys for the sprints well no armstrong is riding there phil just for one reason and one reason only that's to keep out of danger he knows it could be very dangerous on the running towards the finish he's already lost some time especially on the cobblestone section of the race down on stage three into Arenberg. so he wants to make sure he doesn't lose any more time that's big johan van sommeren on the front and he's the one with the orange helmet what a great performer that man is but i do think that today we could see something coming from oscar ferreira this is where you don't want to be at the back end of the pack at the front end alberto contador is also riding prominently in the main field because he too realizes the running towards the finish of a sprint like this a, there's a crash at six or seven kilometers to go bang all of a sudden you've lost 30 or 40 seconds that's right but when we get to the last three kilometers an accident means nothing because you don't lose time so you might see these bigger names fall away at the three kilometer mark to go knowing then if they are unlucky uh, they will come in with the same time but at the moment, the pacemakers of Lamprey for Pataki are coming through. Astana are nursing Contador here, and they've brought him right up to the front of the race. The pace being done by Benjamin Noval. Irony there, because he used to be the teammate of Lance Armstrong. And there's Contador's second wheel. Coming up there as well, uh, Maxine Iglinski, the Kazakh rider on the Astana team. Hinkapi's moving up there with Cadell Evans. You see all of the big names, all of the guys who want to win this bike race overall are riding at the front because of the dangerous nature of all of the stages we've had so far. Little bit of an organization now just quickly coming there from Cervelo test team. This is why Cadell Evans, Phil, is so much happier this year because he's got a man like George Hinkapi who knows just exactly yeah. where to sit in the main field. Cadell is riding in an armchair. He's, read, he's ridden in an armchair since this race left Rotterdam he's either been between, behind Alessandro Balan the former world champion or he's been behind George Hincapie the American champion I don't know if you've noticed that you've got the white jerseys come through like a major rugby scrum here of the boys from Cervelo and they're trying to guide the green jersey you can see him dead center of our picture on the tack on the tail of the white jerseys they're his teammates they may think that he's got a good chance today we know that Freire is trying to get in on the act I had a look there Paul while you were talking at the face of Mark Cavendish he looked anxious but you do at this stage of the race but he's still got Bernard Isol Renshaw all around him yeah, but look at that wind the wind is coming right across that's why another reason why these big leaders of the Tour de France have come to the front field because they're concerned about that crosswind on the run into town because we all know from experience that if you get a crosswind like this on the run in towards a town all of a sudden a guy in front of you can crack and the race splits and you lose 30 40 seconds before you get to the finish line you see the leaders are scurrying to the left hand side of the road because that at the end of the day is the best shelter place once you get trapped into the pack here they're all trying to work out. It looks OK at the moment for HTC Columbia. They've got themselves organised, but and they're not doing the pacemaking. 
that in itself might be a little bit of help we're inside seven kilometers from the finish now that's about four and a half miles of racing it was a glinsky doing the big pace making on the front uh, he will then be relayed by benjamin novell but now the teams of the sprinters are starting to get themselves that little more organized over on the right hand side you've got milram they're trying to look after their man there gerard cholik by the way just out of interest he's the sprinter who is using the biggest gear in the charges to the line he has a 50 tooth chain ring on the outside that means his gear is slightly bigger than everybody else's so if he can get the big 54 54 tooth. 54 tooth yeah it is the biggest plate of the lot even mark uses a 53 i think doesn't it yeah most of the sprinters will use a 53 tooth chain ring and uh, gerard cholik wanted to use a 54 so they had a bigger gear than everybody else but to use that gear he has to have a flying crack crack at the line yes got to hit top speed because the old legs start to crumble as you hit the line there is tor hushoff now thinking of points for that green jersey competition to move him more away from the rest of the sprinters because tomorrow we should see some of the climbers having a go at the big finish in the Jorah's anxious faces here. Jez Hunt's got himself back in the action. He's second wheel now in the white jersey as he sits behind Grifsky. I think it is of Astana doing the oh, work there. Me. They are working so hard to keep this so very, very high now, and the kilometres are dropping away at the rate of one a minute. Johan van Sommeren brings the orange jersey boys from Garmin transitions to the front. They're all waiting now, Phil, to see who's going to take the responsibility, but that uh, Garmin train has now been split up. There's a Savello rider in there, and as well, you've got the organisation of Lamprey now. But Alessandro Pataki to get himself to the position to try and win inside of five kilometers to go He actually needs to be launched to the line by a big lead-out train get over to this side of the road says Mickey <laughs> Rogers We're gonna get ourselves organized. There's a couple of trains coming up on the outside It's the old rivalry again Gorman transitions versus HTC Columbia at the moment The two top American teams with the big sprinters have got themselves to the front of the race of 4.8 kilometers to go Johan van Sommeren on the team for the first First time is driving and again Pataki has organized the Lamprey boys the guy on the front there for them is the Dolto he's the big strong early pacemaker that's Danilo Hondo with the bands on his sleeve there he's that you can see them trying to communicate yeah. trying to explain to each other Johan van Sommeren rode at the front end there he just wanted to keep the pace nice and high take the responsibility off the rest of the Garmin transition team what Hondo shouted there was Mauro Mauro de Dolto is at the head of the Lamprey boys and he wants him to get to the lead and break up HTC and that's what he's done he's moved second wheel push off is sitting right in the middle there he's in a comfortable position not taking any wind at all on his face here as we go back into the front of this rigs and it's Mickey Rogers now lifting up the pace you see how the traffic furniture there has switched the race apart well this is a tremendous piece of racing we're seeing it firsthand here these are the boys the back their day's done well, the peloton is thinning out a little bit, but the men who are driving now, this is Mauro de Dolta of Lamprey who is driving, and they've broken up the Lamprey team a little bit, but their effort now is to break up HTC. Reinforcements from HTC arrive. Well, that's Konstantin Sistov, the man who did a massive turn on the front yesterday, around about 40 kilometers. He's found something very special to drag himself back up to the front. Never discount Robbie McEwen, Never. though, because McEwen is hovering there. He's being looked after by his teammates this afternoon. A little bit of a gentle push there from Fabian Cancellara Cancellara won't be sprinting but he wants to make sure he stays at the front Julian Dean popping in there I've also noticed that Robbie Hunter the South African he's up at the front end of the pack too Sebastian Turgo's team has been penetrating from B-Box has also got himself up there now Sifsos had enough of the three kilometers to go now if there is an accident at this point onwards all riders oh dear me there's nearly one on the side on the right but all riders who did fall will get the same time so the big names of the race will drop to safety a little bit now as this continues to drive on Tony Martin two kilometers of straight now before the riders will finally see the flam rouge Tony Martin is digging very deep now you just may well notice there there's Bernie Isel looking over his shoulder a little bit further back you've got Mark Renshaw and Mark Cavendish locked onto the wheel of Mark Cavendish is Robbie McEwen behind Robbie McEwen is it Gerard Cholik but you've still got the organization of Garmin transitions in the middle they've got three riders locked together waiting for the moment when they start their own lead out
What a build-up this is now. Mark Cavan is in a very, very good position at the moment, but he's going to have to deal with the big boys today because the Lamprey squad have really organised themselves for Pataki and the Garmin boys, we think, are organising themselves for the South African Robbie Hunter to have a go. Watch out, though. The black jerseys are coming forward now of Team Sky. They'll be looking after their man, Bozenhagen. Now, this is a little bit too far out to finish for uh, Bernie Eisel. It's a long ask for him, but I think the team that's going to make These the big list out is going to be Lamprey because they're still well organized over on the left hand side there Danilo Hondo is the man in second position coming up through the middle there you can see Martin Maskant for team Garmin transitions behind him it's Julian Dean and I'm sure behind him it's going to be Robbie, Robbie Hunter the South African well it could well be Geraint Thomas here in the white jersey for Britain who is looking to lead out Edward Boyce and Hagen here but it looks as though they've swamped Mark Cavendish at the moment and they've lost control again because it's Lamprey who've got the control as they take to the the right Gorman transitions are well in but once again the black jerseys of the sky team are getting in amongst it here they don't have the men except one who can deliver and a big run now oh and there was a nasty bit of a movement there the lining up for a right hander well this is the right hander once they go around this corner very shortly they will see the flam rouge right in front of them then there is the start at 750 meters to go a sweeping left hand bend it's Garmin transitions have got the control at the front end of the main field but just hovering there is Mark Renshaw he He's on the shoulder of Danilo Hondo. Here's the right-hand bend. Very shortly, they'll start to sweep around. And then it's 750 metres straight up to the line. Junior Dean in second. Robbie Hunter in third. Garmin transition are in an ideal position here to lead it out for the South African. Well, they swing onto the banks now as we head onto the banks of the River Arrow now. They're in the position. It looks as though Robbie Hunter is the nomination E from the transition Garmin. Garmin transition. Julian Dean grits his teeth. Now, this is going to be a real run here because Robbie Hunter's licking in his team. He's going to have to go here. They're going to try and launch. Grenshaw is on the side of Robbie Hunter. He's hesitated now. And now Mark Cavendish is through on the inside. The Max Missile is about to be launched again. Once he gets to the front, there is no one in the world will beat him. Not even Alessandro Pataki. And he's got the win. Well, did you see who was second across the line there? Tyler Farrow was in there with his bandaged elbow. What a fine performance by Garmin Transitions. If he wasn't injured, he get a lot closer to the man from the Isle of Man but you know what Cavendish Phil he is back he is confident the team did a great job again hats off to Mark Renshaw Mark Renshaw will have to be dubbed I think the fastest best lead out man in the world there's Eric Zabel congratulations again and well, I think he's what just equal Zabel's record of stage wins uh, sorry? He's just equaled Zabel's yeah, stage with Zabel's record and he's equaled uh, Robin McEwen's record because Mark Cavendish now has 12 stage wins in the history of the Tour de France and he's done it in just three attempts at the Tour. But really, well, despite his broken arm, Tyler Farrer has pulled out a big one there, getting onto the right wheel. Robin McEwen right in the mix again. And a wry look glance across there by Gary and Thomas as well in the white jersey. But all happiness today for the man from the Isle of Man. Two days, two wins. Life is back to normal in the Tour de France. Well, it is. But look at this again. You can see the big organization there. It looked for a moment as if uh, uh, Garmin Transitions had it ideally sorted out. But watch the lead out, man. The man in front of Mark Cavendish. That's the most important thing. Mark Renshaw is sprinting for 200 meters to go. Locked in his wheel there is Cavendish. Cavendish waits and waits till the last minute. Goes up through the inside. That's a nice move to do because it forces anybody else to come around the outside. But look at the acceleration. Farrar cannot even get onto his slipstream. He He's not really even right there. Pataki didn't have the power today. He's going to cross the line in third place. A clean win for Mark Cavendish. Win number two. And he's climbing right back up in the green jersey points classification. Well, let's have a look. Mark Cavendish, the victor. Tyler Farrer in second place. Pataki third. Robin McEwen fourth. He's been nibbling all along at the win. Not quite got it yet. Gerald Cholik is in the fifth place finish today. So the sprinters got their day in the end, and Mark Cavendish now has got himself right into gear. Sebastian Turgo also riding well. Points for Torhushoft in the green jersey competition because he's finishing 10th. And uh, Robbie Hunter also in the mix in ninth. Just a funny one there, by the way, for uh, Sebastian Turgo. That's the third time he's finished sixth in the sprints of the Tour really? of France. Good heavens, he's right, been right up there. Geraint Thomas had a great 11th place finish. Having a go at the sprints now, Geraint Thomas, so good for him as the race uh, comes to rest here on the banks of the Arrow River with another win for Mark Cavendish.
Well, uh, no change at all in the overall classification. Uh, still, uh, Fabian Cantillara, the man at the top end of the leaderboard, ahead of uh, Geraint Thomas and Cadell Evans. But what a great sprint here. This is the sprint by the man from the Isle of Man, straight up through the middle. You see Pataki there, the big, powerful Italian rider, trying to come up to challenge, but nobody can beat Cavendish at the moment. No. Now, the five-man breakaway has just been through the feed zone. B-Box, Big Telecom are still driving the chase behind them. Just over 51 kilometres still left to race. Two big climbs to come. Let's get back out on the road and rejoin commentary. As we look down from the helicopter, the peloton here are speeding in the region of 60 miles an hour going down this climb. They're running away from the barrage de Vouglant, heading towards the feeding station. B-Box are still having to be the drivers of the peloton, uh, but it's quick right now, that's for sure. Just at the back of the group, a team that to look out for on the final climb of the day is the team in the lime green jerseys here, Team Liquigas. They've got two serious challenges for the overall victory in Ivan Basso and Roman Kruziger, numbers 41 and 44. Basso, the winner this year of the Giro d'Italia. Roman Kruziger, the winner two years ago of the Tour of Switzerland. A younger rider from the, the Czech Republic, but a man who could create a little bit of a surprise once we go up into the mountains, because a lot of people are tipping him for a high finish overall. There's the yellow jersey comfortably there on the shoulders of uh, Fabian Cancellara. Big question mark is, is, will it be for the last time today and will it swip a, swap mm. across to somebody else? And will that somebody else be Geraint Thomas or could it possibly be Cadell Evans? Well, I know in the UK they'll be all, and I know in Wales in particular, they'll be urging Geraint Thomas to win the yellow jersey. If he does win it, of course, he'd be only the fifth cyclist in history from the UK to pull on the Maillot Jaune. And certainly the first cyclist from Wales. Uh, and that would be a great moment for him. He's, uh, he's living a dream well, as he races through the Tour de France this week. Well, he certainly is, and uh, bear in mind he's already got a, a great pedigree behind him anyway, Phil, because he's already a world champion and an Olympic uh, yep. gold medalist, and uh, to get the yellow jersey would certainly be the icing on the cake at just 23 years of age. Just leaving that uh, beautiful little village behind of Azur where the feed zone was, this valley over to the left here, in fact, is the Bien Valley. It's a 69-kilometer longer river, and it actually uh, raises itself here in the Jura. It's a tributary of the Ain, and it falls down and eventually flows out into the Rhone. And there's the peloton speeding down the most beautiful valley here, gently downhill before they get through to Molange, where there's a sprint, and then they start the climb of the Col de la Croix de la Serra, and uh, that is a steep one. It's in fact, where Lance Armstrong abandoned the tour in 1996, uh, and of course that soon after that he was diagnosed with cancer and the weather was not like today it was horrendous the rain lashed down didn't it Paul? No it certainly did it was a horrendous day and that was the day that uh, Armstronger pulled out everybody thought at the time that in fact he was suffering from uh, some kind of uh, bronchitis because he was coughing blood and they thought uh, they needed to send mm. him away and get him ready for the Olympic Games of 1996 in Atlanta it was only later that year that he was diagnosed with testicular cancer, which had spread with complications to his abdomen, his lungs, and to his brain. Yeah, and the rest is history. The next time he would return to the Tour de France, he'd win it. And that was an, an incredible comeback for Lance Armstrong. Still in the race on this very day. And if all the cards fell right, then he would be winning it for the eighth time. That's a tough call, let's face it. Here's the feeding station for the peloton now. It's rather like being at the fairground. If you see the object, grab it and you might win a prize. Well, the prize on this occasion will probably be two bottles, one with water and one with an electrolytic drink. <laughs> yes, that's right. But you can see just how dangerous it can be there with bags getting dropped, bottles getting dropped, riders zigzagging left and right, and it's one of the most dangerous points of the day. And in fact, the rider there over on the left-hand side has just got something stuck in his rear derailleur. He's jumped off to, to uh, rectify that problem, and you do have to pay attention. I would always say if you're a young rider, the most sensible place to be is actually at the front end of the pack. You ride in the first 15 to 20 places at a time like this, and you're going to lessen the chance of being involved in an incident. It also has slowed down the pacemaking a fraction while everybody tries to get on board their bags and bottles and distribute them into their jerseys, into the, the holders, onto the machine. And that should give a slight advantage to the riders in that leading group of five who are still riding at around about three and a half minutes ahead of the race. Just moving uh, through this part of the Bienne Valley as the main field makes their way down this valley, a very long valley indeed. We're not far away from uh, the regional nature park of the Haute Jura, 
And in fact, this park is a, an area which covers a whole part, a huge part of the Massif of the Jura. And it's an area that Julius Caesar did not like at all because he nicknamed this Wooded Mountain in the war against the Gauls. And it was uh, a lot of the climbs around here are called Les Joux. For example, the Joux Plan and the Joux Vert. And that all goes back to the uh, old days when they described the mountains by the, the shade of the climbs, whether they were bluish or greenish. In fact, uh, we're not too far tomorrow when we go towards the climb of Morzine Avoria as the riders on their other side, in fact, uh, if they turn to the right instead of turning left, would go over the Joux Vert, the green Joux. Well, once they're through this sprint pool, they'll be on the climb because the Quad de la Serra is nearly 10 miles long. That's a tough, long climb, isn't it? Yep, 16 kilometres of climbing, a long way uphill, but as far as Jérôme Pino is uh, doing for the day, he's just crossing these climbs off one by one and adding to his lead in the King of the Mountains classification. But I have to say, Ruben Perez is also doing a very good job, yeah. uh, the young rider there in the orange jersey of Uscatel Uscadi, because he's climbed up very nicely, thank you very much, into second place. Only two second category climbs remaining, but the most difficult of the day. Well, they've made the start of the climb, and this is the sprint here in the little village of Molange. Uh, again, nobody seems to be sprinting. Hondo got, the, Hondo rather got the first two. He's on the front again. Will they give him a third one, or will somebody else? Little Samuel Dumoulin at the back is a pretty good sprinter, but no. Through they go, and Hondo has got three in a row there. Well, Hondo is, uh, let's not forget, a very good sprinter in his own right. He was brought to, brought to the Tour de France to look after the interests of Alessandro Pataki as the, the lead-out man. We were talking in, in the newspapers this morning, they were talking a lot about the, uh, the pilot fish for all of the sprinters. Well, he's the pilot fish for Alessandro Pataki, just as Mark Renshaw is for Mark Cavendish. And, of course, uh, a little bit further on, you've got Brent Lancaster, who looks after the interests of Tor Hushoft. Well, no real punts, points change there, but now this is a big challenge if we start the Quad de la Serra. Well, it's never a good sight. We've just started the slopes of the Quad de la, Quad de la Serra. The gap is down, 241. We're going through the back of the peloton here with the cameras. Robbie McEwen has been seen some way back as uh, suffering from the accident when he hit the cameraman yesterday through no fault of his own. He is suffering today. Tor Hushoff Paul is also suffering. It looks as though they're forming what you would call the autobus. Well, I would know all about that because I've been in the autobus on many occasions when I was racing. This is the group of riders, the, the sprinters, the non-climbers who get together to try and survive. Gerard Cholik, uh, the man who was right up there in uh, second position on the stage yesterday, he's also a member of the autobus. Their job now is just to survive and get to the finish because you have to get to the finish of every individual stage of the Tour de France within a certain, a certain percentage of the winner's time. And that percentage changes from day to day. It's as little as 5 or 6% on the flat stages, on the mountain stages, depending on the severity and depending on the average speed, it can be as high as 15%. But you can lose 15% very easily on the slopes of a single climb when you know that the men who are fast on the flat cannot rival the speed that the climbers can produce on the big mountain passes. And here we are again, too, but as I say, Mark Cavendish is now behind the race. The field here is slipping away into all sorts of bother. And it looks to me as though we've also got trouble there for Martin Mascant on the far side of the Garmin Transitions team. A bit surprised Zabriskie. to see him here. And Dave Zabriskie, number 59, uh, he's also uh, on the far side there. He's uh, suffered a lot over the last couple of days at the back end of the main field, but I'm not sure whether or not in the back of his mind he's trying to uh, reserve Ooh. something for one of the flat stages. And this is well, what happens when the elastic snaps, you go back pretty rapidly. I no. also noticed that uh, Jez Hunt had gone off the back of the group too. Well, for Jeremy Hunt, the UK rider, this is his first experience of the mountains in the Tour de France. It's his first attempt at it. And uh, his job is to lead out on the flatter stages, so he, common sense says save some energy, join in this group, and just pedal in and try and beat the system. One of the Sky teams there, Steve Cummings, has also been dropped back here. Well, they will look to try and get themselves into one of the groups and uh, make sure they will have calculated what the elimination time is going to be on a day like this, and uh, they will try and make sure that they get to the finish inside of that elimination time. There's the rider who was on a breakaway on the first road stage of the Tour, Alexander Plusin. He's the national champion of Moldova, and he now is uh, put to the back of the pack, again, looking for that autobus, just looking to survive on this mountain stage, and those are the guys who, over the next couple of stages, Phil, will be just riding the Tour to try and survive. 
survive and stay in it. I think this is a mental thing now. These boys have really stayed in the race until this point. They know how hard the Quad de la Serra is, and they said, that's it, we're out of it, and they're going to try and reform, and they'll come in in quite a big bunch. We'll see a process of elimination on this climb, but when we move across then to the final climb, the Col de la Mora, which ends four kilometres from the finishing line, which is not a flat approach to the finishing line either, then I think we might see a very small and interesting group of riders. And that's what the team managers are waiting for, to see which riders make that final split. Then they'll plan the day's win tactics. Yeah, I have a feeling they're all in a sort of a planning mode as well at the moment, Phil. They're all waiting to see just exactly who is going to respond and which team is going to take the responsibility of going out on the attack. I'm a bit surprised to see this man in difficulty, Lars Boom. He was the first attacker of the Tour de France this yeah. year. Well, that's not surprising, really, because that was on Dutch soil, and he is a former Dutch national champion. So Lars Boom himself in trouble. Picking our way up through the, uh, the main field here, you've seen the, the riders who are being left behind because of the tempo, which is still being dictated by Boeg Telecom on the front. They've done a phenomenal job here this afternoon, and let's hope their man, uh, the French national champion, Thomas Vokler, can turn it round and pay them back for all of the pacemaking that they've been doing. You can notice, uh, never very far away is the turquoise jerseys, jerseys uh, with the yellow sleeves of uh, Team Astana. That's the team of Alberto Contador sitting in the wings, waiting to see whether or not they're going to dictate the pacemaking on the final climb of the day. This is Anthony Charteau still on the front, still hammering along there. Uh, just over to the right-hand side is Nicolas Vaugondi. He's the national time trial and champion of France, but you can see by the red, white and blue bands around his sleeves there that's an indication that he's a former French road champion you can only wear those bands if you've been a, a champion uh, of your country in the discipline that you're actually racing in sitting at the back this is uh, one of the riders from Quickstep who's also having a spot of bother Martin Wynance the rider there from Team Sky just hanging on to the back end of this group is Serge Powell's he's the Belgian rider on Team Sky a lot of riders now put under pressure we're really coming up to the most difficult part of the stage it's one of those uh, horrible stages where you start off with a, a reasonable climb then it gets a little bit harder and a bit harder after that as if somebody's just turning up the cranks as if they're tightening the rack alessandro pataki he's a winner of two stages of the tour so far and uh, he will be looking at trying to rival the green jersey of hush maybe later so this is Alessandro Pataki here, who's dropped off with the other sprinter from South Africa, Robbie Hunter. And one by one, they're all giving best here, Paul. It's because of the fast tempo with this tailwind. Well, it's also because of the incredible job of work that's been done by uh, B-Box Boy Telecom. Uh, they've been told to ride at the front, they've been told off by the team management, and now uh, little Thomas Vokler has decided he's going to try and uh, pay back the work that the team has done. And he was just trying to make a move off the front end, and he's going to try and ride across the gap here, and I wonder uh -huh. if anybody will respond to this. Well, the B-Box team are all on the front in blue. Now it looks as though Vokler wants something to liven up here. Now, Vokler was a man I thought might have made the break. It didn't happen. He's made a move now, and Case de Pan, who weren't in the breakaway for a change today, are coming across, and a big effort here. Well, this is probably the hardest, best chase I've ever seen from B-Box Boy Telecom. They really have set something up. Thomas Vokler now is trying to set himself up, and he's looking to try and ride across the gap. Not necessarily sure that this is a very clever tactic, because he probably would have needed to wait till it came back a little bit closer, but then all of a sudden, the race is uh, telling us that the gap to the five leaders is only a minute and 15 seconds, so it could be a good move by Vokler. He could reach, this would be very typical of Thomas Vogel. He's not here to win the Tour de France, he's here to win stages like he's done in the past. He's worn the yellow jersey, but he was never seen to be a winner. Tony Martin there, number 115, he's gone to the tail of the bunch, and the reaction setting in, and also Serge Powers of Team Sky in trouble now. This is a very serious planned attack by Voigtler. Well, this was the stage, I think you and I both talked about it this morning, who would be looking for the breakaway? Well, we would had said that with this man, Thomas Vogel would look for the breakaway. Once the breakaway was gone, it looked as if he'd missed out on his chance here this afternoon, but now his team are trying to put things to rights. They've done an awful lot of work. There's a little problem at the back there. That's one of the riders, uh, again, uh, look, one of the riders from... Uh, it, yeah, it's uh, Hernandez, Astana. it's Hernandez there. Yeah, yeah it's Jesus Hernandez. He did. Jammed his gears, maybe? Yeah, well, it was just one of those little things. He tried to change down a gear, and it jumped up too high, and that uh, put him under pressure. Vokler has been joined there, Phil, by two or three other riders, and they are, in fact, starting to form an interesting group off the front. I tell you, that's exactly what you don't want in the peloton when you're fully stretched, because it's disrupted the peloton as well. 
Hernandez is going to have to try and get himself in. Look at the length of that peloton now. And if we can hold the picture till we see the back end of it, I think you're going to see a lot of riders in trouble now. So the big question is going to be on everybody's mind, can Fabian Cancellara stay in this group with a race happening as it is currently? Because this is a serious amount of pressure on the penultimate climb of the day. And I, for one, would have expected the big showdown to come on the final climb of the day. So if they're starting the well, aggression here, it certainly can change a little bit later on. Absolutely. 11 kilometres to go to the summit and only a minute advantage, though, those five leaders are going to be caught for sure now. Well, uh, you know, uh, these are the sort of climbs when you can see accidents happen at any time, and it's always uh, very scary when you see it happening on the front end of the main field. Guys are going forward all of the time trying to find themselves a place into a breakaway. And again, uh, I noticed that the Case de Pagne rider going across there for was Mathieu Perger, and he was in the breakaway yesterday. And he was second in the King of the Mountains, very anxious to rejoin them and see what can happen in take on Jerome Pinon and now uh, Rubens Perez, because they're first and second in the mountains. This is the most in, and this good bike, that, well, that's the Moulin being picked up, isn't it? Yeah, it is indeed. The Moulin's come back very quickly to the chasers. And Matty Lloyd has got himself into that split. This is at the back end of the group. This is the former world champion, Alessandro Balan, a teammate of Cadell Evans. And he's been put under pressure here because of the acceleration that's come from B-Box Telecom and now from the attack of Thomas Voigtler. Matty Lloyd in there too. Now we are seeing a very different face of the Tour de France now. Welcome back. Interesting developments here on the Croix de la Serra because Fabian Cancellara, the yellow jersey, has oh, been yeah, dropped yeah. off the main oh. peloton. He was 23 seconds behind, which would put Geraint Thomas in the yellow jersey. As things stand, he's 17 seconds behind and trying to ride himself back on. Let's get back out on the road and rejoin commentary with Phil and Paul. Well, we're inside now, 30, 40 kilometres to go. We've still a long way to climb uh, to the summit of this, something like eight kilometres. This is a very select little chase group, but it's not getting away up with the leaders now. We've lost Samuel Dumoulin here, only three riders going forward. Well, just looking at the uh, yellow signs on the road there, those are painted by the, the Nike box, and they are messages uh, to do with the Livestrong Foundation. You can... Uh, Get into the Livestrom.org website and put a message and send it through to the website and they will try and print it out on the road for you if you have a loved one who is afflicted with cancer. And there at the back end of the group riding through the uh, the yellow part of the course there, this is the move coming from Mugotier of B-Box, Boyg Telecom, Matty Lloyd taking up the pace making just behind him. He is looking there, looking to try and ride across a one and a half minute gap. B-Box, Boyga Telecom are riding today like a team possessed, and it's great to see the French teams riding with such aggression. Cyril Gauthier now of France, really trying to pull this away. The peloton almost came up, and the hammer's gone down again. Matthew Lloyd is in this group and wants to get clear. And, you know, if these boys can just contact that little group of three left up front, then th this would be a very different race to the finish. Jose Ivan Jose Gutierrez has gone now. Well, he's been the breakaway before. We had talked about uh, K. Stepania being a very aggressive team, and they're looking for something this afternoon. They probably realise in the back of their minds, Phil, that the big leaders of the race, the men looking at the race over the three-week part of this course, will be holding themselves in reserve, possibly for tomorrow. And that's why they're trying to take advantage of this. The erstwhile leader, Fabian Cancellara, is on the defensive here. People had wondered whether or not these climbs were good enough for Cancellara to stay in contact with the main field, but I don't think anybody expected the penultimate climb to be ridden with the aggression that we're witnessing. Well, I'll tell you what, with Cancellara drop, the, blade, the break within reaching distance at the moment, it is Geraint Thomas of Wales who is the virtual yellow jersey of the Tour de France. A reality, or is it still a dream? Well, we're only a few kilometres to find out. 37 and a half from the finish now. Voigtler wants this break to go, but he needs stronger men to help him. Matthew Lloyd's just going to do enough here. He's not going to kill himself on what is the virtual first real climb of the Tour de France. No, but it's, uh, it's laying down the foundations of what's going to be another very tough day tomorrow because I think everybody expected this to be a stage runoff fairly easily. But the way B-Box Boy Telecom have thrown everything at this stage here this afternoon, it's going to be a very difficult peloton to come out and try and race again tomorrow. So the uh, race situation uh, that we're looking at here is uh, the three leaders at the front with the, the leader of the King of the Mountains classification, Jérôme Pinot. 
36 seconds is the gap down to this group, which is the Thomas Vogler group. Red, white and blue on the front there, champion of France. A little bit further back at one minute is the main field. There's somebody had a mechanical incident there at the side of the road there. In fact, they were stopping the group to allow a group to come back. Now, is this Fabian Cancellara riding himself back into the peloton? <laughs> he is a man. We call him Spartacus because yes. he rides, he fights and rides Phil like a gladiator. Fabulous Cancellara comes back into the play, but I don't know if you noticed that, Paul, Damian Acuna goes during that break and that is significant with Lloyd and Voikler. If they can get round a few corners out of sight, there may be an easing of the peloton, especially if the Mayo Journals come back. Uh, they may just wait and fight again a little bit later on. Here they all come, and at a rush too. And so it's good to see Serge Powell has got in there for Team Sky as well. So a little regrouping there. Here he comes, Cancellara fights on, and he gets his rewards. Well, he's a real pro as well, because as soon as he made his uh, contact with the group, he put his hand up immediately. That was for the team car to come forward. He'll take on board as many drinks as he can and get straight into the front end of the main field and distribute that to his leader, Andy Schleck and Jens Voigt and the rest of the guys from Team Saxo Bank who are surviving. But a few desperate moments there for Fabian Cancellara, but for the moment, he's still got himself back into yellow. Yes, and so that might be the signal. Look how they slowed down now. There's still a ways to go up this climb, over five kilometres. So Thomas Voigtler, Matthew Lloyd, Damien Acunigo, Mathieu Perger, uh, they've got a chance now to contact those three leaders. Well, it just uh, comes back to mind, Phil, what uh, Damiano Cunigo said this morning. He said, I've allowed myself to go a long way down in the overall classification because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to win himself stages. And he's gone a-hunting today on what might be a day that the big boys don't want to chase down because tomorrow it could be a big showdown on the climb to Avoriaz. Well, there's uh, Konstantin Sivstov moving up to the front there to... Uh try and take a little bit of control of the range of the front end of the main field and that may well be to look after the, the foundations of something like a move from Mickey Rogers this afternoon. And that's like one year of Kofidis who's trying to move clear. Uh, he's having a good season. The gap has opened up all of a sudden. The 122 back to the peloton and the yellow jersey's back in it. As uh, There he is and Cancelo is not only back in it, he's gone back to the front. As he, he's playing the real patron here. He's really checking out everybody. Now, this is the interesting... Uh, this is at the back of the race at the moment, no, This it? is the front oh, of the sorry, race. Oh, sorry, this, this is, Pino, is Hondo, yeah. Pino and Hondo. They've been chased by 32 seconds with that group of Matty Lloyd and Damiano Cunigo. And Cunigo is a dangerous man to go clear. But now there's only two men left at the front. So just two riders remaining at the front end of the main field. They're dispatched uh, Christian Canis. This is the second group on the road. There in the middle there is Thomas Vogler, Mathieu Perger in the black jersey of uh, Case de Pagna. He was on the breakaway yesterday. Damiano Cunigo, former winner of the Giro d'Italia, has made the junction with this group. And uh, this is a lot of work being done there by Cyril Gauthier, a young rider participating in the Tour de France for the first time. They're all over the road here trying to keep the pressure on as much as possible. We're looking at a minute and 18 uh, seconds now from the two leading riders back to the group behind containing the yellow jersey and the recovery there of Fabian Cancellara. But it does not bode well for the final climb of the day because this, you, know, you look into the faces of these riders, everybody here is under pressure. They've had a very hard climb, the penultimate climb, and uh, that main field has really been reduced dramatically in numbers. The race situation and the spread is uh, the king of the mountains uh, in that group, and again, to Fabian Cancellara going off the back of the pack here with George Hincapi, the American national champion. Big pressure on Fabian Cancellara. He is a great man on the flatlands. He's not one of the great climbers of the world. And as he said to us this morning, he doesn't always enjoy the heat. And it has been a very hot Tour de France here this year. We're looking now at a minute and 11 to the yellow jersey group. But he might just recuperate on the slight downhill before the final assault to the top. Looking here at the peloton of the Tour de France, they're now a little semblance of a normality assembling around the, the contenders of the Tour. But don't forget, we've got uh, Voikler, Lloyd, uh, Cunigo, Perger, and Raphael Vallis. And if you say who, he's in his first Tour de France and rides for the Futon Savetto team in the group, which is trying to contact Jerome Pino and uh, the other survivor up there, Danilo Hondo. Well, uh... Fabian Cancinara is uh, doing the old yo-yo at the moment, Phil. He's going off the back and finding a little bit of courage to get himself back into the group and then getting dropped off once again. But I think that's a sign of the times, a premonition of what's going to happen to Fabian Cancellara on the final climb of the day. While we go back here to this man, Jerome Pino, 
He is riding like a man with a mission this afternoon. He's just hoping to survive a little bit longer to get to the top of this next climb, the penultimate climb of the day, to get himself another 10 points into the bag in that King of the Mountains competition. Well, I'm impressed with Danilo Hondo. He won't help now at all, Pino, because he knows his teammate Cunigo is on the way up to them. Even so, that gap is down to a minute. It's out to a minute and a quarter on the yellow jersey with the group in between. So this is now proving very, very interesting as there is another move here from the bunch as well. Well, everybody prepared here to have a move. They know, I think, that the big heads of state, the men who are looking to win this bike race, are watching each other, waiting for the final climb of the day. Evans is watching Schleck. Schleck is watching Contador. <laughs> Contador is watching Menchoff and Wiggins. They're all waiting, I think, for the final climbs. This is like Sylvain Chavanel, who's come across the gap here. That's Kolobnev with him, too, on the right there. He's also moved up with Chavanel. Kolobnev's also saying, I want to win the stage of the Tour de France. Everybody wants to win the stage of the Tour de France. Of course they do. Is that fair a bit? No, that is Juan Manuel Garate, the winner of the stage to the summit of the Mont Ventoux last year. Now, these are three dangerous riders to allow to go off the front end of the group because they have the ability of surviving. Look at the chaos at the back here once again, pulling himself back into the race. Fabian Cancellara, he is not going to go down, Phil, without a fight. He'd be quite happy to have the yellow jersey for another day if he can. And he's coming back, and Yaroslav Popovic is alongside him there, the teammate of Armstrong at the moment. But back he comes again, the peloton has slowed. Hincapi went off with Cancellara, so he also needs to come back into the group. There he is just in front of Fabian. So Hincapi has also got back. But this, uh, this is a very serious move here for the day's spoils. Well, it's another very serious move, just going straight through and past the camera there by Sylvain Chavanel. Sylvain right. Chavanel is obviously looking for something big this afternoon. Chavanel has gone from the bunch. He's also still lying fifth overall in the Tour de France. Maybe he could regain his yellow jersey uh, just for another day, perhaps, as we go in the high mountains tomorrow. This is the group that seems to consolidate a nice little lead at the moment. Just We're calling it the group Oikler. Just catching Christian Canise there on mm. the left-hand side. He was in the breakaway early on. Mm. Vokler has got the mask on mm. now, and he's got himself uh, dedicated to trying to organise and drag this group off the front. They're about 30 seconds away from uh, the leading two riders, but they're now around about a minute in front of the main field. Now, this could start to smile for Thomas Volkler. He needs to pay back the work that's been done by his team because B-Box, Boyd Telecom have done the job this afternoon. Well, the pressure here has got rid of little Samuel Dumoulin. He's been dropped from this chase group now. He came down from the league group, remember? The other members of that league group are in here. Perger, the rider in the black, who was in the breakaway all yesterday, looked very good when he rode past camera. And Cancellara, we hear, is now back in the group. Indeed he is. But look how small the group is getting now. This is going to become a group of very elite men who have been battered on the climb. And Cancellara refuses to, to go down without a fight. Well, he is a warrior, and that's what he's doing this afternoon. He's trying to keep himself in contact there. Not necessarily to keep his yellow jersey, but to make sure that Andy Schleck, his leader, has always got somebody alongside him in case there's any mechanical incident or he needs a bit of a hand on the final climb of the day. Well, up the road are opportunists now, riders who believe they can steal the stage. These two are still in front. Jerome Pino would just want to get over the top and get another 10 points in that King of the Mountains, and then he knows they're going to come a-hunting for him on the last climb of the day. Hondo will not help him, but he also, as a gentleman, will not try to outsprint him at the top either. He knows his team captain's on the way up, Damiano Cunigo. Well, you know, you're not supposed to take sides, but I'd like to take a side and be on the side of this man if I can, because Jérôme Pinot, who went out and announced that he wanted to get into the breakaway today, is doing a phenomenal job of work. He's got maximum points over every one of the King of the Mountains points on the course here this afternoon, and I'm only hoping that he can survive and get another 10 points at the top of this climb. This group may well spoil the party if they catch them before the top, but I really believe that Jérôme Pinot, Phil, deserves another 10 points. You bet he does, and he's got two kilometres to survive the chase here. This is Perger. He's got the red number on his back as the most aggressive rider yesterday. He made a late bid for victory from that front group. Minute 52 to the yellow jersey. That's the spread between the leaders, and there's only two of them now. And these three are trying to reach the other group up front. There's a split at the moment. 43 seconds back to Voikler. Surely that's enough with two kilometres to ride. Well, fingers crossed. Uh, that's the group there of uh, Jose Ivan Gutierrez, the Spanish national champion. He's seen the opportunity this afternoon to try and slip into a move off the front end of the main field. He's obviously got great form 
otherwise he wouldn't have won the national championships just a week before the start of the race no, Sylvain no. Chavanel though has uh, flown the coop of everybody and he's trying to ride himself quite possibly back into a yellow jersey at the end of the day he's looking for a minute and one second on Fabian Cancellara and uh, his time trialing ability and in fact Phil he's got himself across to the gap and he's joined Thomas Vokler and that's really strengthened this break now Chavanel we saw he was in the lead for 187 kilometers on the road into Spa his reward was a yellow jersey then the next day the tour bit back he had flat tires bike changes lost all the time he gained and now he's looking for just over a minute to go back in to yellow it puts him into a complicated situation because it's his own teammate who's riding 35 seconds yeah. ahead of him on the road looking for more king of the mountains points it doesn't seem as if the main field are too concerned with the composition of that group of the road and they may well be given a certain amount of freedom because the main field have now slipped back to two minutes that actually puts Sylvain Chavanel into the lead Yes, you can see the way the peloton here, the, the favourites are looking at each other, they're not going to push the pace, there's a real chance here, this could be the move. This is the top of the climb of the Col de la Croix de la Serra, and big points at 10, in fact. Oh, sorry, it's one kilometre to go, as they've turned left there, so one kilometre, just over half a mile, that should be enough as they go on to very narrow roads here. This is a nasty road, and it kicks up just towards the summit, so the final kilometre of uh, climbing 0.6 of a mile to the top of it and you can almost see the pain there in the shoulders of Jérôme Pinot as he starts to rock and roll a fraction I think he'll uh, sit up once he gets to the top because he will know that there's a teammate in the group behind him chasing along well this looks like uh, the shape of Egoi Martinez and he's another rider we tipped as a possible name for the victory on a stage like this this afternoon again Uscatel Uscadi the main field, I think, are slowing down a fraction now and starting to swell in numbers and all of that because of the fact that uh, everybody has had a very hard time in the race today and I think they're trying to muster a little bit of energy before they come to the final climb of the day, which is just as hard as the climb that we're going over currently, the Col de la Croix de la Serra. One kilometre to go for the chasing group and they're looking for still around about 40 seconds. This is the group of Thomas Vokler just sitting on the back there uh, wearing number 107 and that's uh, one of the riders from Omega Pharma Lotto. That's a Spanish rider, David Moreno. He's in the group with uh, Matty Lloyd. And again, another move going here. This looks like it's uh, Ronaldo Nocentini, the man who wore the yellow jersey in the Tour de France last year for eight days. It is Egoi Martinez. And attacks are now coming thick and fast as all of the riders who may well be a little bit further down in the overall standings are starting to think, ah, these main contenders are not going to fight it out on this climb. I can get a steal and a mar I can steal a margin. So the peloton, a semblance of common sense perhaps, as everybody's hit each other, they've now stayed together. They're not far from the summit now. Well, Ronaldo Nocentini has seen this as an opportunity. Don't forget this opportunity last year presented itself to him and he got himself a yellow jersey at the end of the day and that's what he's looking for as he goes through one kilometre to go to the finish. I have a feeling, Phil, that on the slopes of the final climb we will still have a very serious sort out and Jérôme Pinot has got himself to the top. I don't think Danilo Hondo is going to take these points away from him. He wouldn't dare uh, because he's done no work. His job now is to await the arrival of his team captain, Damiano Cunigo, and he's saying something to him there. He's probably saying, hey, man, let's wait now because they're coming and we're not going to make the next climb. The next climb carries double points, but that's been a great, great day for Jérôme Pino. He's putting his hand up now. He wants to be excused. No, he doesn't. He wants a drink. Well, this is the second group on the road, and there you can see the man who was in that break uh, a lot earlier on, and there's a little acceleration going, and that is going to be for Matty Lloyd. Matty Lloyd now, Phil, knows this well. is a second category climb, and don't forget he was the winner this year of the King of the Mountains in the Giro d'Italia. So the big climbers are making a play now as the Tour de France goes into the high mountains where the big points are waiting for them. Matthew Lloyd, the winner and the only Australian ever to win the King of the Mountains in the Giro d'Italia. He's now looking to get his first points in the King of the Mountains. Anna Carty over there. Well, Paul, I'll tell you what happened. Sylvain Chavanel pipped him on the line. Oh, the man from France, no. the teammate of Jérôme Simon, went straight over the top to make sure that Matty Lloyd didn't get too many points because he will know the reputation of the Australian. But he's trying to keep the buffer for Jérôme Pinot as long as possible to get a good lead in the King of the Mountains classification. Great tactics and very much an alert ride there from Sylvain Chavanel. 
He took off just one point. Stop Matthew Lloyd getting it. He got seven there, Matthew Lloyd. Now back to the peloton. It's the Astana teammates here of none other than Alberto Contador, who was setting the pace, but the red shirts too of Radio Shack. They're there for Lance Armstrong, showing they can give as good as they get, because if the camera pulls back, this is not a big peloton anymore. Well, Cadell Evans should be in there. I was just looking to see if I could spot the oh, um, no, rainbow he jersey. Back again, and by the uh, way. Fabian Cancellara just struggling once again at the back end of the main field, but he will survive here, Phil, because one thing you must remember about Fabian Cancellara, he is probably one of the best downhill racers in the sport of professional cycling. Yeah. So even if he goes over the top of this climb 20 or 30 seconds behind, which he's not going to do, he would make contact inside of the first two or three corners on the descent. Well, he's going to work very, very hard, but there's no doubt out of the order of the top Pino, Hondo, Chavanel, Voikler it was in fourth place Perger. So current standings are 44 points at the moment and 20 for Perez. That looks like Sergio Paulinho on the front there, riding it to set the tempo for Team Radio Shack, while this man at the back is struggling, Fabian Cancellara. And in front of him, you can just see the tail end of the main field, and Cancellara pulls himself back onto the tail end of the group just as they crest the summit of that climb. So he'll be on the way down, no worries at all then. This is a nice, fast descent now, takes us down to the valley. Don't forget, we are now just on 28 kilometres for the leaders from the finish. Hondo is a great descender, and so he'll have no worries here. But it's going to be a great battle of the Col de la Mora. Well, we're now looking at 22 kilometres to go. Uh, two minutes and 23 seconds is the advantage of the two leaders over the main field, but there's an 11-man group caught halfway across the gap. As you look from the peloton, Paul, you can see Contador down there. He wears number one. You can see Cancellari in yellow has got himself back into the picture. Armstrong is down there. I can never pick out Bradley Wiggins, I'll be honest, but we know he's in there, and we know the white jersey two of Geraint Thomas is in there. There's the 25-kilometre-go there's the 25 kilometer go banner to the finish for the, this group of riders. And as you can see, the two men at the front, they are giving it everything on this descent. Hondo now is prepared to share the pacemaking with Jérôme Pino, and they're still looking at around about a 50-second advantage. Sylvain Chavanel, not one of the greatest descenders in the world, is actually the man setting the tempo here, and he's actually starting to chase down his own teammate, Jérôme Pino, because he can feel, having tasted the yellow jersey on the road down into Spa, losing it the next day over the cobblestones to Arenberg, he's now in a position to take the yellow jersey back again. Again, and he probably didn't even believe that that was going to be possible at the start of a mountain stage like this. Well, a complete reverse of the tactics on the road to Spa now because it was Chavanel who ran away to get yellow and Pino got the king of the mountains. Now we've got Pino up front and Chavanel chasing him. But, uh, you know, this is the way it will go all day today. This is Linus Gerdeman here of Team Milram. He's the man expected uh, to flower in the big climbs uh, this year for the Team Milram. Well, he's uh, got himself into that low, dis low position there, like a ski racer going as fast as he can downhill into an aerodynamic position right at the front end of the machine, and he will be taking a lot of risks going around these corners. And uh, there is somebody riding just uh, on the road in front of him, and I think that is Konstantin Sifsov, the rider from uh, Team HTC Columbia. He was going away from the pack about 10 minutes ago, so it could well be Sifsov there. This might be 20 kilometres to go. That five kilometres went quick, didn't it? As we're now continuing the long descent, remember we start the climb when we get to the bottom of the hill. It all goes uphill again, then it stops just four kilometres from the finish of serious climbing. It's going to be a real showdown once they climb away from this valley. Well, that's uh, when the serious action is going to begin to take place. Uh, those two riders at the front here, Jérôme Pinot and Danilo Hondo, are still holding on to it. They're having a bit of a discussion now. They're starting to realise, yeah, well, I've got Damiano Kunoga behind. You've got Sylvain Chavanel. What are we going to do next? <laughs> it's a very good point. Armstrong's right up at the front of the peloton at the moment, too, as they continue to chase. Uh, Sylvain Chavanel is trying to drag this chase group along across the gap. Then behind the gap, them are, is in fact Sipsov, and then also uh, Linus Gerdeman. Hats off to Sylvain Chavanel, he could well be in yellow. He's getting a gap here, and it's opening up. He's the virtual leader on the road right now. Yeah, well, if we stop the race right now, then he would be in the lead of the overall competition. They're going inside of the 20 kilometer to go mark for them. They've actually lost a bit of time on the descent field because they're a minute and three seconds behind the two leaders. But he can't descend, that's the problem, Chavanel. 
And just looking across there at Damiano Cunago, he was saying to the uh, rider from Lamprey, what do we do? We've got two teammates in the front. It's a bit of a quandary to be in, but I think the most logical thing, if I was the team manager right now, I would actually ask the two leaders to sit up and wait for that group because they could be getting a victory of the stage for Damiano Cunago, and they could be getting the overall lead for Sylvain Chavanel. But in the main field behind, the pace is now being dictated by Team Radio Shack of Lance Armstrong. And in the second row of riders, it's the Astana riders, of course, of Alberto Contador. If Isn't we that talk, strange? It, it is indeed. But if we talk about uh, the heads of state, if you like, of the Tour de France, they have just sat outside and watched the battle go all around them today. None of them have made a move. It's those scurrying for the stage win, or perhaps a yellow jersey for a day, who have made all of the attacks. These boys, the big favourites, are waiting for tomorrow. Yes, they will. You know, tomorrow's a different kind of climb. The, the summit finish here today, Phil, uh, peaks out at just over 1,100 metres in altitude. Tomorrow, it's 1,750 metres in altitude, and it's a much longer, steeper climb to get there. And there we get a chance to see. I think that was just an indication of uh, 16 kilometres to the summit of the climb. So we've actually started now the final climb of the day, the Côte de Lamourou. This has got to go down as one of the best days in the career of Danilo Hondo, though. He's a sprinter, not a climber, and he's had an incredibly de good day out in the front. And has never been put in any difficulty. Remember, we dispatched the others in the breakaway. They've got rid of three of them. This looks like Perger trying to liven up this chase group. First time Tour de France, and looking like we may have found a, a superstar in the Tour. Two days, and he's been in the action both days. Been in the action on both occasions. 20 kilometres to go now for the yellow jersey group. Uh, the group there containing both the white jersey of Geraint Thomas and containing the yellow jersey of Fabian Cancellara. Sylvain Chavanel now well, has got the bit between his teeth. The yellow sun is reflecting what might well be by the end of this day. He's comfortably in the race lead of the Tour de France right now and he wants it, so that's why he's jumped away. Make them chase him. Well, exactly the same thing, Phil, has happened at the front because now Jérôme Pinot, the man who wears the King of the Mountains classification, has done exactly the same thing. He's left Danilo Hondo behind. You just said that Danilo Hondo was not one of the great climbers. Yes, he's a phenomenal sprinter. It's his third attempt at the Tour de France, and he jumped Danilo Hondo. Hondo's decided, well, I might as well wait now and see if I can help out my man, Damiano Cunigo. He starts the final climb of the day. He is hoping to survive at the top of this climb because at the end of the stage of a climb, is more than a second category climb there are double points available so there's 20 points for him in the king of the mountains classification and why not a state victory as well and on the road behind him chasing as hard as he can is sylvain chavanel well the french are having a great tour strangely enough and sadly enough i'd have to say the two frenchmen who are making the racing here this afternoon are actually riding for a belgian team team quick step so this is the situation now as we look here at Jérôme Pinot. He's had a great day out this afternoon. He's got himself maximum points over every mountain pass that the race has been out. That's the difference there. You can see now it looks as if Damiano Cunago now has seen the possibility that he too wants to try and get across the gap. He knows the ability and he knows the power of Sylvain Chavanel being chased there by the other rider, the teammate there of Matty Lloyd, and that rider who was trying to get across the gap there was Daniel Moreno of Spain and of Omega Farmer Lotto, and he knows the power of Damiano Cunigo. Cunigo has won mountain top finishes in the Giro d'Italia, and he has seen how strong Sylvain Chavanel is, and he's now currently trying to get across the gap himself. There's Chavanel just around the corner. The yellow jersey group is slipping away on this first stage of the lower mountains because the yellow jersey group is now at three minutes to Jérôme Pinot. Just moving left and right to Chavanel. Chavanel, uh, let's not forget as well, Chavanel is recovering from a very nasty accident in the, the one-day classic Liège-Baston-Liège where he crashed a where he, in fact, to lay down the foundations for his victory a couple of days ago and fractured his skull. And it took him an awful long time to get back into the sport, but 71 days after he crashed and suffered that fractured skull, he rode himself back into the sport and he won a stage of the Tour de France. And this is Chavanel coming across the gap now. Chavanel's in his 10th Tour de France. I don't think Hondo will even attempt to get onto his wheel here in any way or form. 
Hondo will look over his shoulder and wait. He knows exactly what's going on here. He knows that his own teammate, uh, uh, Damiano Kunigo, is coming across the gap. He will muster a little bit of strength if he can and try and help to reduce the gap to the Frenchman here. The Frenchman is looking at riding himself back into the yellow jersey here this afternoon. And what a great turnaround for the books from a man who was in hospital in the month of April, who's back at the top of his game in the month of July. So this is the gap. The man who leads the race uh, in the King of the Mountains, uh, Jérôme Pinot, is 38 seconds ahead of his own uh, teammate. A little bit further back, we don't have an exact check there. 53 seconds to Vokla, three minutes to the main field. The main field now on the slopes of this climb of the day. So just sitting at the back end of the pack there, you can see uh, David Miller of Great Britain is uh, very happy to be in this group. In this group as well, Geraint Thomas, the second place overall in the group as well. The yellow jersey, Fabian Cancellara, has been off the back and recovered and pulled himself back into this race on a number of occasions. Andy Schleck moving up there now and having a little bit of a chat to see what the reaction is going to be of the other contenders in this race. The silver helmet in the second row there is on the head of Lance Armstrong. And there is Fabian Cancellara just sitting at the back of this group as George Hincapie moves up a fraction. He's looking after the interest today of Cadell Evans, the Australian, who started the day in third place overall. So Hincapie comes to the front, setting the pace. There's Chris Horner on the pavement over on the right-hand side, teammate of Armstrong, Alberto Contador comfortably in there. Now, what's this? This is Andreas Cloden. Cloden seems pretty happy. I'm not sure what that's all about. So, no, Brakovic. Well, it's a rather strange manoeuvre there, I'm not quite sure what was going on at that point. As we come back to the group, there's David Miller, 57, teammate uh, of Christian van der Velde, who had to leave the Tour de France. He was the favourite to four team Garmin transitions for a high finish in the overall standings, but had to pull out with two broken uh, ribs. And Hincapi coming to the front, and he's obviously the big ally for Cadell Evans this afternoon. Well, this is, uh, is it the last throws of Big George? He's been off the back on the previous climb. Here we are now as we head up the last climb of the day, and he's come to play his part as the ever-faithful teammate and drive for as long as he can at the front. So the race at the front at the moment is all about Jerome Pinot as he continues there. Three minutes, six seconds. Uh, there's no doubt that Chavanel, if he keeps firing like this, the yellow jersey awaits. Well, there's the chat. This is Wilfred Peters, the team manager. He's come up alongside Jerome Pinot. He said, look, just behind you there, we've got Sylvain Chavanel. The two of you can get together. So the situation at the moment is that Pino has gone. He's got rid of Danilo Hondo. Hondo's already been passed by the chasers behind. Uh, and it's an incredible ride by Pino. He's won everything so far today. He's now trying to win the stage as well. Uh, but behind, the race still splits up, and the man most likely to be in yellow tonight, Paul, will be Sylvain Chavanel. He's still ahead and trying to chase his own teammate down. Well, slipping off the back of the group here, uh, this, in fact, is uh, Edwell Bosenhagen. He's a sprinter well, on the team. that's a surprise. It is a surprise, but don't forget, Phil, this is his first Tour de France. He's got a lot to learn about himself, a lot to learn about his body, and a lot to learn about a race like the Tour de France. And he's taking on board a bit of food here. He may well be going through a bit of glucose exhaustion, but Arrière de la Course is not somewhere where we expected to see him. David Miller also coming to uh, be subjected to the same fate. Yeah, this is interesting. This. I think everybody expected the peloton to go to the last climb and explode they weren't counting on it happening on the penultimate climb and they've been completely blown out here it's caught them all off guard that's a small group but interestingly paul the big names the names we've talked about for a week now are still in that big pack yeah, they were actually just looking at each other, trying to see if they can read any of the body language to get an idea of who's going well, who's not going well, who is hiding their game. But they will not be able to hide tomorrow on the slopes of the final climb of the day because Morzi Navoris is completely different to this kind of climb. It's a much longer climb, it's a much steeper gradient, and it goes to a much higher spot at 1,750 metres above sea level. Well, they still not, may not be able to hide on this one as the cameras pick out the lone leader on the road. Now, there were five, there were two, then there's now only one as he goes under 15 kilometres to go. So he's got 11 kilometres of climbing still to go on this 14-kilometre climb. Sylvain Chavanel is racing for yellow and he's closing in. 
Well, the time gap has just come through at 19 seconds. The yellow car you can see just up there is the neutral service vehicle. The vehicle looks after all of the riders should they have a mechanical incident of any sort. And that is following Jerome Pino. I think Pino has turned off the gas a fraction to wait for his teammate Sylvain Chavanel. These two guys were in the breakaway together, a long breakaway, a breakaway of eight riders on the road down into Spa. And then on that occasion, it was this man, Sylvain Chavanel, who went away and got himself the victory, but he had a double header because he also got himself the overall lead. Chavanel started the day in fifth place overall, and he was looking for a minute and one second over Fabian Cancellara. Right now, currently, if we were to stop the race, he would be the new overall leader because he's three minutes ahead of the yellow jersey group. George Hincapie has come to the front in the Stars and Stripes, a champion of the United States. He is setting the tempo. There's been no reaction at all from Saxo Bank, no reaction at all from Liquigas of Ivan Basso, or even yet any move at all coming from Team Astana. That's, uh, David, uh, no, no, that's David de la Fuente just over on the left-hand side of Astana, handing out the drinks to the rest of the guys. As uh, we can now see Pino getting on board uh, an energy bar to keep the energy levels topped up. These guys can use up to five or 6,000 calories on a day like this. Kunigo dying for the victory this afternoon. He seriously wants the win if he can. That's what he came to the Tour de France for, to try and get some wins under his belt. But he's now looking at around about a 55-second deficit to the two leaders who are about to join together their forces. Well, he did warn you in the papers, Paul, he was out to win stages, and the little prince, the Petit Prince, is trying now to catch up with Chavanel, who in turn is desperately trying to reach Jérôme Pino, his mate. Well, he did try once already, Phil, and to get across the gap, and he couldn't get to the wheel of uh, De Sylvain Chavanel, but this is more important to me because Jérôme Pino, I think, has sat up a fraction and waited for his teammate Sylvain Chavanel to come across the gap and join him. These guys have obviously come to the Tour de France with great form. Pino, a stage winner in the Giro d'Italia. On the other hand, the man who's chasing him, Sylvain Chavanel, fighting back after a nasty accident in the month of April. And what a great turnaround for Quickstep as a team, too, here. They've had a great share of the limelight in the Tour de France, thanks to these two riders who are now in tandem. Big effort by Chavanel. And back. Abbe, again, well, he's going backwards. He's living a yo-yo lifestyle today, Cancellara. Well, he's going forwards and backwards. Uh, he's a man who would like to keep the yellow jersey on his shoulders for another day, if at all possible. We talked about the permutations. We talked about Geraint Thomas, Kedel Evans possibly being the new yellow jersey at the end of the day. We could be talking about somebody completely different. We could possibly be talking about Sylvain Chavanel, who's dropped Jérôme Pinot, and he's going on. Ah. He's a man possessed this afternoon. He wants the yellow jersey again having tasted it once after the stage to spa he wants to try and grab it one more time well i would say that he has had no choice here jerome pino his legs now will not feel part of his body that will tell everything he's finished now he's riding in a daze as Sylvain Chavanel continues on the climb. The man who is racing for yellow today and looks pretty certain to get it, in my opinion, is now the Frenchman Sylvain, Sylvain Chavanel as he heads home. 13 kilometers to go. As we look here at what is left of the field in the Tour de France, all the favorites are still here. Lance Armstrong, Bradley Wiggins peeping into the picture. Gary and Thomas is in there as well as uh, as Alberto Contador. They're trying to pick up this group here, and their head on his own in solitary splendor is still Sylvain Chavanel. This first time, uh, Valle, Rafael Vallis is also trying to go. Now, I've no idea who he is. He's in his first Tour de France. The whole team is first-timers, and he is trying to put himself in the front of the Tour de France. Well, you know, he's a young professional, Phil. He turned professional only last year when he rode for a small team in uh, Italy. This year, he's had himself a victory, and it was in a race called the Tour of San Luis in South America in the early part of the year. He's had a couple of top ten places, but he's never ridden a race at this high level. Level. while we scoot up the road with the magic of television to this man this is Sylvain Chavanel and he probably never dreamed at the start of today that he would have a crack at getting the yellow jersey back onto his shoulders but he's doing a great performance but unfortunately for him now the climb is starting to be a little bit more painful and he's got to try and conserve as much of his advantage as possible he should be able to do it because he's a great individual time trial he's a former French national time trial champion
Well, he's going to take the 20 points for the King of the Mountains, and that's significant because he's only taken it, and it's his teammate Pino who's the leader, so it's like throwing 20 points in the bin, which is a very good tactical move. He has uh, 10 and a half kilometers to go to the finish, so he's got six and a half kilometers still to climb up to the top of the point where the mountain officially ends. This little group here, though, and looking now at the back, here we get our first view of Gelan Thomas. Is he going to hang on to the tail of that peloton? He's got a few kilometres to go yet. Astana are packing the front. Cadell Evans is peeping in round the left. But, you know, Lance Armstrong doesn't have too many Radio Shack boys left, if any. Well, uh, he's just sitting there himself, uh, sitting on the tail of the riders, doing the tempo behind him. Garrett Thomasville has just cracked off the back end of this group. He's a great track rider, but he's only 23 years of age. He was hoping to stay in contention. He was dreaming about a yellow jersey at the start of the stage, but this, for him, is part of the learning curve. He'll come back to the Tour de France again and again. He'll get close to that yellow jersey in the future, but this is all part of the learning curve. Well, it's a very young body. He's just 24 years of old, actually. He was He's 24 years of age in April this year, uh, but this is really his second crack at the Tour de France, but the first one where he's been projected as such a talent of the future. It's going to hurt him all the way up now, but he's there's a lot of big names been dropped before Geran Thomas today. Armstrong, look at this, deja vu of old. Armstrong sits in fourth place in the peloton right now as they try to chase down the lone leader who is free to fly. Uh, Geneva's on the roadside there, that's in Switzerland. We don't have to go that far today. Ten kilometres to go, and that is for Sylvain Chavanel. And uh, he, he should have a good lead in the Tour de France tonight because the riders first and second have now been dropped from the lead group. Well, I tell you what, uh, Sylvain Chavanel has only got six kilometres to go to the top of the climb, and then it's a false flat on the running down towards the finishing line here in the Station des Russes, and for him, that could be important. He's gone over all of the climbs of the day while just a little bit further behind him. Astana are now taking the responsibility. Alberto Contador is sitting in fourth position, sitting behind the man who last year was his own teammate, and that, of course, is Lance Armstrong. Second on the road is Rafael Valsferi from Spain, rides for Futon Cerveto. He's got to be the big revelation. In fifth place in the main field is Andy Schleck. The big boys are moving up to the front. Cadell Evans is also looking very comfortable. He is the best place rider in this leading group in third place overall because already Cancellara has disappeared and so too has Gerard Thomas. He'll be in the runner-up position of the Tour de France at the top. He knows what that's like. He's finished second in the Tour de France twice before and lost by second. But at the moment, it's all about Sylvain Chavanel who is opening the pace and these boys waiting for tomorrow but they, you can't keep up you go back there's Cadell Evans in the rainbow jersey he'll be second overall tonight there is Bradley Wiggins the man you said you hadn't been able to spot number 31 he's quite comfortable quick calculation because of the removal of Cancellara and Guerin Thomas all Sylvain Chavanel needs now at the top of the finish bill is 22 seconds over the group of Cadell Evans to keep the yellow jersey and the power of the man that he's showing us this afternoon I've got a funny feeling that we could see Sylvain Chavanel bedecked in the yellow jersey tonight I, I think that's for sure but by how much that's the big question will it be enough to hold them all off on the climb to Morsi and tomorrow on the eve of the rest day the first one in the Tour de France and then we go over the giant Col de la Madeleine on Tuesday well he's going to be surely in yellow that is for sure there he is he's given his best shot brilliant piece of tactical riding it's great and easy if you've got the strength to do it as we're on to the climb of the Cote de la Mora and it finishes at just four kilometers from the finish of the race the crowd are relishing this I wonder if they realize what a great battle they're watching on well, the roadside. I'm not sure if they do but a quick time check on the yellow jersey of Fabian Cancellara he is now at five minutes and 35 seconds he's a long way further down the road he's got Jens Voigt alongside him to encourage him up to the top but these guys they will be thinking about changing the tactics now they will have enjoyed the yellow jersey the yellow bike the yellow helmet now they've got to think about Andy Schleck and the rest of the mountains. Well, sadly, there won't be any yellow jersey tonight for Gerhard Thomas, but I'll tell you what, the French won't be complaining.
Well, look at this now. This is the capture of Jerome Pino, the hero of the day. Going back to the lead bunch here, containing Wiggins, Armstrong, Leipheimer, Contador, and Andy Schleck. He knows, though, he's left his teammate in the lead, who seems set now to win the stage, and he's certainly set to win the yellow jersey. Well, can I tell you one thing, Phil? You're probably not going to be very surprised when I tell you this, but Jerome Pino has just been awarded the prize for the most aggressive rider on the stage, and I don't think we can really complain about that. You no, know, the only other man who qualify would be his own teammate, uh, Sylvain Chavanel, who's up front there. And he's being chased all of the way by this youngster and the rookie of the tour, Raphael Valls, who is creeping closer and would be desperate, but he might yet catch uh, Chavanel and spoil a perfect day for quick step. Well, this is the group behind her. There is the leader of uh, the Futon Soveto team, and that's Eros Capecci, and he's uh, sitting in that group. Work now being done at the front end of the group here, and this, of course, is by Chris Ankersorison on the front, and he's doing it for his teammate Andy Schleck. None of the big pre-race favourites have really been caught out by today's stage. They've had a fairly watching game. They've kept an eye on each other to make sure that nothing really strange happens. But they will come out and do battle once again tomorrow. But there will be some very sore bodies, I would say, in this race. Chris well, Horner was also on the back of the group. Well, the heart rate of Angus Sorensen right now is 172 beats a minute. I would have thought it would be more than that. Uh, Cadell Evans has had another good day, though, because the Australian world champion has sat in this group Followed them, never been in difficulty, and he'll wake up tomorrow morning lying second overall in the Tour de France. A perfect position. Yellow might be coming his way soon. But the lone furrow being ploughed here by Sylvain Chavanel of France, and he's being chased down by this youngster who must be living a dream. We can't believe all the people that watch this bike race. He's never been here before. But as he gets towards the summit of the climb, he's going to start to lose a bit of time on Sylvain Chavanel because Chavanel is a great individual time trialist. He turned 31 years of age just before the start of the tour on the 30th of June. He's won 33 wins throughout his career, but most of his victories, Phil, have been in the individual time trial. So when he summits the climb, he will actually be going into a terrain that suits him a lot better than the uphill section of the course. Yes, Vallis has actually cracked here. He's gone out from 38 seconds to 50 seconds behind Chavanel at five kilometers to the finish. So his bigger worry now will be being picked up by the chase group behind because uh, he almost got across. You can tell by his face now, it's the pain of being a, a young man and not quite as mature as somebody like Sylvain Chavanel. Well, there we're looking at the third group on the road there. That's the group there with Thomas Vokler in it. Vokler was uh, for a long time riding alongside Damiano Cunigo. And just going clear off the front of the Vokler group is Juan Manuel Garati. You can just pick that out because the uh, Rabobank car was right up alongside him. Now, these three riders, the remnants as well, have been a terrific attacking race, but all the attacks came on the Col de la Croix de, la, uh, de Serra, and now they consolidated on this climb. Fabian Cancellara is now eight minutes behind and counting uh, from the lead rider on the road. So once he gave up, he really did give up, and he's surrounded by a couple of teammates uh, to try and get him home OK. Five to go for the chase, and the peloton and Johan van Sommeren sitting at the front here just trying to keep them in touch with the action at the moment, but this has been a, a rough day for Garmin today. Well, uh, this is Johan van Sommeren coming to the front. He's doing the pacemaking for Ryder Heijerdal. There's Armstrong, his face looking very concentrated. This Ooh. is a move by Francais de Gere looking for the lower placings a bit further down the overall standings. Well, he's just uh, he's done a little, uh, a little sprint off the front there. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true, Paul. Uh, Ryder Heijerdal, a strong man in that break there. Now, without Christian van der Velde, who crashed out of the race, he's probably the man for a reasonable position in the overall. But this is the man who is absolutely crucifying himself today to get the first prize and the yellow jersey. And he's riding very, very well indeed. Over the top of the climb then for uh, Sylvain Chavanel, he gets the 20 points, he didn't need them, but he stopped everybody else getting up for Jerome Pino, his teammate. Now he knows now it's four kilometres, he knows he's not flat, but it's no longer hilly like he's been. It's zip up and race for yellow. Well, he's going to get the big gear going around now, he's a great individual time trialist, he's been the champion of France on a number of occasions in the individual time trial for him now. It is a solo ride to the finish, not only is it a solo ride to 
stage victory number two and that's already a great success for French cycling but it's also going to be a yellow jersey number two as well for this man as he plows that furrow down towards the finish line second place on the road uh, this Spanish rider Rafael Valsperi Phil is about to get joined I reckon by Juan Manuel Garate who's not too far behind him he too is going to get himself second place over the top of the climb and he's got three and a half kilometers to go to the finish that's not very much more than two miles well as we enter the mountains of this year's Tour de France we have a new name here in this youngster he obviously is a man of the mountains he's holding it now he seemed to crack but uh, in fact Chavanel is not pulling away from him now the flags of the United Kingdom the flags of Switzerland this is a very very international race these days they're looking on Jerome Pino has been unhitched here I thought he was going to hang on in that field, but he's had it now. He's had a great day, though. Look at that smile. He'll be going up on the st on the podium for the next few days to collect that leader's jersey. Well, what a way he did it. He went out in that breakaway early on. As he predicted, he was going to try and get himself maximum points. He got maximum points over every one of the first climbs of the day. The only one that escaped him was the final climb of the day, and that went to his own teammate here, Sylvain Chavanel. And it's well, still a little bit of a roller down towards the finish. Poor old Sylvain Chavanel. He thought he got to the top of the climb. Not quite yet. Well, we're still two and a half kilometers to go for this lead and I tell you if uh, Chavanel didn't have a hearing problem today he's going to have one by the end of it the way the crowd is shouting into his ear there he's French although he races on the Belgian team and he's going to get France a second stage win the way it's going well, this is Christophe Le Mavel going clear, the best-placed Frenchman Very in the Tour de move. France last year, and he's looking to try and move himself up a little bit in the overall standings. Bear in mind, he lost a bit of time on stage three when the race went over the cobbles all the way down to the forest of Arenberg. Well, he might be the long-term hope of the French for a high finish. He finished ninth in the Tour de France last year, and uh, he's dropping away from the action and the attention for the favourites to have a little go and nibble at a few seconds. Don't think he can reach this man now at two kilometers to go. He is free to fly for yellow and for the stage win. He's on a high now and the adrenaline will pour. Well, what is quite amazing is when he crossed the finishing line to win the stage into Spa and not only take the overall yellow jersey, one of the first people to congratulate him was Eddie Merckx. Eddie Merckx, a winner of the Tour de France on five occasions. I just keep looking down at the bike and the name of the bike that Sylvain Chavanel is riding here this afternoon. That's a bike that was made by Eddie Merckx as well. Well, that, uh, that will give you all the inspiration you need anyway. Jerome Pino has done himself a favour today, maximum points apart from one day, one climb. As the now it is a coming together here because that's Damiano Cunigo still bashing out the messages and this is going to be a move by Christophe Lemevel. Are they going to say, do you want to come or not? And I don't think Cunigo's got it. He's gone straight by him and it's now two kilometres to go for Vals. Well, nobody's going to see Jérôme Pinot at all because for Jérôme Pinot, for Sylvain Chavanel a little bit further up the road, there is the Flamme Rouge, the oh, last la kilometre la. of the race for him. But look how painful it is now. Well, he's going to drag up over this last kilometre or so up to the finishing line, but the pain he'll be able to push away and forget about until tomorrow. But right now all he's got to do is consolidate and conserve as much time as possible. It's great to win a single stage in the Tour de France, but to win two in one single Tour de France is really quite quite special that's something that's normally reserved only for the sprinters men like Alessandro Pataki or Mark Cavendish but for this kind of rider it's a rare occasion nice to see the Welsh flag flying proudly alongside the British Union flag there for Geraint Thomas there'll be cheers for him he hasn't done what he hoped he might do today and take yellow but he's very much a man for the future in the Tour de France we've seen that today and over the last week but today it's all the Tour de France for a Frenchman and that's the safety look over your shoulder. That's when you take the inspiration. Keep tight to the barriers. The shortest way to the finishing line here as we now arrive at the Station des Rousse for the first time in the history of the Tour de France. So it's only fitting a Frenchman should bring them home. Then he'll jump off the congratulations and one of his boys will start the watch. And the watch will tell him he has become again the leader of the Tour de France. You can't do better than that. Well done, Sylvain Chavanel, because this man, on both occasions, to get yellow, he's had to do it all by himself. And that's it. He's back in yellow and he's taken it off Cancellara, who took it off him a few days ago.
Well, Chabonel well, the winner. What a return for Chabonel, and what a return, Phil, for Team Quickstep, because they were robbed of what they thought was their tactical advantage in the Tour de France this year, when Tom Bonin, the Belgian national champion, couldn't start because of a recurring knee injury. Then all of a sudden, it was the two French riders on the squad that turned the tables around for them to get them two stage victories, and now again tonight, they will lead with the yellow jersey competition, but also in the King of the Mountains classification. But retain the name of this young man, because Raphael Valsferi is going to be a man we will talk a lot about in the future. He's going to finish second on the first mountain stage of the Tour de France. And what, a, an, what an emotional time that is going to be for him as he comes inside of the last 150 metres to go. A great ride by this young man. And as he comes up towards the line, he lost uh, time all the way to it once he came off the top of the climb. But nonetheless, Raphael has held off the chase behind. Oh, let me see that finishing line. 56 seconds, just about. He is behind today, and Garati nearly had him. This is Juan Manuel Garati, the man who triumphed on Mont Ventoux last year. Not quite the hilltop finish this time around, but a very good move for Garati. He is an extremely good rider, and he's almost as old as, it, as Armstrong and Co. in this race. Well, he's a former Spanish national champion. Uh, the deviation there, getting all the bikes and all the cars out of the way. Garati's going to cross the line in third place. There shouldn't really be any separation in the group behind Thomas Vogler. He did what he could this afternoon. He's looking at fourth. So this is it now, and Volkler, who was a, really a candidate for the win today, and there's never to be, but Thomas is in, Perger follows him, Matthew Lloyd follows him, and this is the peloton, it was right on them as they almost came over. I think it's Federigo there who's got placed on the line. Well, everybody else in that group, I noticed Armstrong, Contador, Andy Schleck comfortably in there. The big heads of state today were not too concerned about chasing down Sylvain Chavanel. I think the big men, Phil, that we will look to to win this race overall will come out tomorrow and lay down the first pedal strokes in serious anger. Well done, the Sylvain Chavanel. And, uh, yeah, they're waiting for tomorrow, but they still put the pressure on. If you didn't have the strength to hold that peloton today, you were dispatched out the back and a lot of riders were dropped. Geraint Thomas really did try to hang on. It was just a little bit too far for him, but his turn will come of that, I'm absolutely certain. Sylvain Chavanel, that look. Well, you might just have seen there, Phil, just below his eye there, you can see the scar, which is a part of the remnant of that very nasty crash he had yep. in Liège, Baston Liège. There's confirmation of the stage result. Chavanel, Vols, Garate, Voikle, Perge, Moreno, Federigo, Hegedal got in in eighth place there, a minute 47 back. That was the time basically, but they've split time the peloton as they would, as it's officially a mountain top finish here. Nice little pan around the area too, and you can see the great crowd which is down there. Look at that as they enjoy the arrival here in De Rus. Very warm day indeed. So the Tour de France has uh, answered the call with a great race today in the mountains. Je vais me répéter encore une fois, je regrette pas d'avoir si souffert en début de saison. Je pense que les prochaines années I think uh, for the next couple of years I won't be able to race as much as hard as I did today. C'est rare de me voir comme ça sur le tour. It's very rare to see me like this during the Tour de France. Voilà, j'ai une bonne équipe autour de moi. I've got a great team uh, who, uh, who are supporting me. Quick Step, Quick Step is a great team. Uh, the, the start of the climb, I had really good legs. These are the kind of climbs that really suit me, the shorter climbs. Uh, tomorrow's another day. And uh, I just, for the moment, I just want to enjoy it. Que vous a-t-il dit que vous que lui avez-vous dit à ce moment-là que s'est-il passé exactement En fait, j'ai euh, ma tout well, seul. I was talking to my teammate Jérôme Pinot. Uh, vas-y. And vas he vas he's just to make carry on because I've got nothing left in my legs. <laughs> ah, la belle image. La belle image, ça fait la deuxième fois. Well, that's uh, the uh, uh, congratulations coming from his teammate there Jérôme Pinot. And uh, they spoke on the final climb of the day and uh, Jérôme Pinot just said to him, "Look, I've got nothing left in my legs. I can't do anything at all." as he comes up to the line. A nice celebration by Jérôme Pinot. What a great wow. ride by him today. I think that was absolutely fantastic. When a, when a plan works, it all looks so easy. But they came out today to plan to do this. Jérôme even wrote about it in this morning's papers. He told us he was going to attack. He was gone as soon as the flag dropped. And it all worked out so well to allow Chavanel to leave the leading group 
bridge the gap and win the day. It's just too perfect for words, quite honestly. Well, it's nice when it works, Phil. Uh, Sylvain Chavanel is now the overall leader of this race ahead of uh, Cadell Evans by a minute and 25. Hazardal in third place, Andy Schleck up into fourth, Alexander Vinokurov up into fifth, so I presume in sixth place we'll find Alberto Contador. And off our camera, I can tell you, Gedan Thomas has just finished. Uh, about five minutes down in the end for Gedan Thomas. The yellow jersey is still out on the road by quite a long way. As you can see here, he continues to climb. He's going to lose over ten minutes, I would think, because he's still got quite a way to go up to the finish. When you drop the yellow jersey, you really have no reason to race for second. No, uh, Fabian Cancellara now has enjoyed winning the prologue in Rotterdam. That was his first major goal of this race. Then conserving it all the way down through the flatlands down to the mountains he was hoping to do that he's done it and now what he will do is change his tactics he will switch across to be a team helper now with team Saxo Bank and try and set up a victory in the Tour de France for his teammate Andy Schleck well he seems uh, fairly happy about that he, he knew what he had to do there's George Hincapi over to the right hand side just in the middle Christophe Moreau at 39 years of age talking to 38 years of age Jens Voigt over on the left hand side there's going to be a lot more battles to, do, to go in the Tour de France before we get up to Paris and tomorrow of course will again be a major battle in the mountains because we go up into the real high spots of the mountains tomorrow the Alps are certainly on the horizons the Jura I suppose you could regard very much as an aperitif it's almost like a god of honor he is. He comes up towards the top of the climb. He's got his teammates with him, Full Sang, and he's got behind him Jens Voigt as they just ride up the mountain. Yes, once you lose yellow, what's the point of fighting to hold it in third or fourth overall? Well, no, what he has to do now is conserve as much energy as possible because they're going to have hard days, the boys from Team Saxo Bank, over the next couple of stages, Phil, because they are going to try and turn things around now and try and set something up for Andy Schleck. And tomorrow is no easy day either because in the last 40 kilometres, you've got the Col de la Ramaz and you've got the climb up to the ski resort of Morzina Voriaz. Yeah, and it could be even a quarter of an hour down. He's still four kilometres to ride to the finish here, Fabio. In Cancellara. So these are the groups of the survivors. Uh, we saw a great battle at the front. Uh, none of the serious contenders actually showed us anything at all, really, whether it was Armstrong showed no emotion, Contador showed no weakness, Andy Schleck was very happy to be present there. Cadell Evans has moved himself up into second place in the overall standings. Now, Cadell Evans could be looking very seriously at the possibility of the yellow jersey tomorrow because uh, behind Cadell Evans is Ryder Hazardal. I'm not sure whether or not Sylvain Chavanel can conserve his advantage on this over the slopes of Morzina Voriaz. Just here to confirm once again there, you can see Chavanel is a minute 25 ahead of Evans, the 132 ahead of Hezidal. Contador is up there into sixth place. Nicholas Roach of Ireland is up there into eighth. That's a great performance. Denny Menchov is in tenth at two minutes 35. All the big names are up in the top ten. Well, we're looking here at Tony Martin slipping away. The pace has suddenly got violent on the climb here. The Col de la Ramez and a breakaway of seven out all day has split up. And uh, Murunhut is out front now on his own. I think he'll be caught by two of the teammates, uh, two of the remnants of the breakaway, Mario Ertz and Mwanya. But all of the work in the chase, Paul, is being done by Team Sky. And it looks as though Fletcher here doing some great work uh, for Bradley Wiggins. Well, Fletcher really is turning on the gas there, followed by Geraint Thomas, followed by Thomas Lovquist, followed by Bradley Wiggins there in fourth position. Behind them is Carlos Boredo. He's looking after Sylvain Chavanel, who currently is riding fairly well. But I'm a bit surprised to see this man going backwards because this is Tony Martin. Yep. Mind you, I'm not that surprised because he lost 19 minutes yesterday. Yes, he cracked big time yesterday. I'm just wondering if he's a little bit sick here because it's not like Tony to be cracking so quite so early on these climbs. This is the first first category climb of the Tour de France this year. It is really, really hard, and it's 14 kilometers in length. The breakaway went onto this climb with an advantage over the main field of four minutes and 17 seconds, but they've hit it so quickly. The, the bunch has just imploded. Well, wait until you get to six kilometres to go to the summit, because that's when the gradient starts to get a little bit fiercer. It climbs up to 8.5% gradient. The next kilometre after that, you crank it up a bit higher to 9.5% gradient, and it continues at that gradient for the next two or three kilometres. These are the two that is a coming togetherness now. 
Uh, this is Amiel Mwanya of France, the King of the Mountains in this year's Paris-Nice. He's having a little bit more of a struggle, though, because uh, Mario Ert, who's ridden the Tour de France on ten occasions, has just pedalled across uh, to another veteran, really, of the world of pro cycling, Kus Murunaut, himself a seven times Tour winner. We've got three pretty good guys at the front now. The gap to the yellow jersey is 3 minutes 28 and of course in between the remnants of this breakaway well just uh, for a little bit of humor and these guys are not laughing themselves phil but they just went through the small hamlet of messy and i'd have to say there's a few fighters in the main field probably feeling it is a bit messy out on the roads of this climb because this is a tough one well mark cavanish by the way was unhitched uh, very early on he made no effort to keep up with the peloton but he wasn't alone neither did tor hushoff and a whole host of riders who don't like the mountains they've quit quickly formed at the back of the race what we call the autobus which is where they all get together and try and hold together and ride home together knowing that if they can keep a big pack of them together they won't get eliminated from the tour well slipping backward uh, lots of riders with big names because just slipping backwards there was the former french national champion uh, peric federigo and the former world champion alessandro balan it is amazing to see the job of work that's being done by team sky the yellow jersey of sylvain chavanel Looks comfortable good. for the moment thank you very much sitting in around about sixth or seventh place well, we're now penetrating the lower slopes of the Alps here. We're racing into a formidable area. Uh, the cycle race has been here many, many times over the years. Moors in itself is a popular stop-off town, but Avoriaz isn't. We'll go, be going there for only the seventh time in tour history. And look at that. Also, we're losing De La Fuente there, a teammate of Alberto Contador. This fast tempo is hurting these boys one after another, and they're just hoping they can hang on. Well, uh, Jens Voigt is being dropped off the back as well, and you know what is interesting about this? I think the tactic for Team Sky is to go as hard as possible on this climb here, Phil, to isolate all the other leaders in the other teams, so that, for example, Andy Schleck has no teammates alongside him, to make sure that Alberto Contador has got as few teammates as possible alongside him. This is obviously the plan to move Wiggins up in the overall standings. Well, at least Team Sky are taking this race to Alberto Contador, and reputation is not counting much right now. Now, Wiggins is a man with a different confidence now. Welcome back. 3.25 the gap from the yellow jersey group uh, to the leaders. And Chris Boardman, Sky are still driving it. Surprised to see them on the front so early. We are. It's, uh, it's a very aggressive move. Uh, and Wiggins must be, must be particularly confident. But clearly, they know what they're doing. Uh, and it's costing them. Uh, Garrett Thomas already out of the back. Um, but they wanted to put some pressure on. They want to do it early. And it's pretty fascinating to watch. And we're, we're going to enjoy the, uh, the explanation of what the tactics were after the stage. Because it seems early to me. All right, it's early for Chris Boardman. Sky are after it nonetheless. Kus Morenhout, Mario Ertz and Amal Mwana are still out front. And there you can see Bradley Wiggins, second wheel, as the chase goes on behind them. Let's get back and rejoin commentary. Well, you get some idea of the slope now of the Col de la Ramez. The riders do appear at last to be climbing some steep climbs. The Mayo Jorna Sylvain Chavanel could be dealing with another surprise here. He's right near the sharp end. But whatever the plan is from Team Sky, they're putting it into effect. They've got their riders right on the front of the chase. Well, uh, around about uh, almost six kilometres to go to the summit. This is actually the steepest part of the climb, four miles to go to the top, and it's starting to tilt up to its most difficult gradient, 9.5%. Sylvain Chavanel, Phil, I would have to say, is riding like a champion, like a real yellow jersey. He's trying to yeah. prove today that he didn't get that yellow jersey yesterday by accident. Now, we're just looking here at the Team Sky Fletcher. I think he's had enough, has he, Paul? No, he shakes his head. Terrific pacemaking on the climb, but he's now done all he can do, and he's going to drop off the front. Well, he's done his job. He set the pacemaking for the first few kilometres, also dropping off the back there, one of the riders from Katusha, the Russian rider, Edward Vorgonov, just giving you an indication of how we're starting to have the first serious sort out. They're going up this climb as if this was the final climb of the day, and I'd just like to remind them, Phil, that once they've gone over the top of the Col de la Maz, it's downhill along the valley floor, then they've got to do the same thing again up Avoriaz. I have to say, Paul, I cannot understand why Sky are doing this. This does not seem a sensible thing to do at all. They've destroyed Fletcher now, and they've got all the other riders with the team players sitting right behind them. 
Well, everybody else is watching to see what they're doing. And in fact, what we're seeing is a situation here where Bradley Wiggins is actually isolating himself. While we can see riders uh, slipping off the back end of the main field, Rene Tarame, yeah, the Estonian rider, he's popped. And he's a very good climber. In fact, he won the first climb of the day over the Petit Jus after just uh, 24 kilometers of racing today. But he looks as though his legs have gone rubbery. This is the old story, isn't it, Paul? You never know how your body's going to react when you get to the Alps. Well, you don't. So just looking down, uh, you can see a lot of the teams are looking at Team Sky and trying to decide what their tactics are. There's a lot of riders still in this group from Saxo Bank. They're waiting. Look at this. voikler has gone. Bit too hard for Thomas Voikler, the French national champion. And just in front of him is Sergio Paolino, the Olympic silver medalist in the road race from Athens. Goodness me. Well, all the local cyclists told me yesterday that this was a real, real tough climb and not to be underestimated. As we see now, Sergio Paulinho also drop off, but don't forget they had to get Armstrong back into this race with a tremendous chase just before the climb started. So uh, we can understand they're going to be a little bit tired right now. That was Maxine Bouet going forward there, uh, going backwards, I should say, from uh, AG2R. Another problem here at the back. And Now, this is uh, quite interesting because this man slipping back here, in fact, is uh, Kevin Duet of Team Quickstep, and I'm not sure what he was looking after. Well, he's won the quick step, boys. He's been up front all day, keeping the pace. The yellow jersey is in trouble. The yellow, all of a sudden, the yellow jersey. So the pacemaking of Team Sky has destroyed the Mayo Jean, as well as Fletcher, by the look of it. He has cracked, and look at this. He still has five minutes to climb. Five well, kilometres, sorry. Five kilometres, yeah. It's about, it's about 15 minutes. Climb, minutes. Yeah. Well, that was a surprise because he was looking very comfortable, but I did say, Phil, this is the steepest part of the climb, between seven kilometres from the summit to four kilometres of the summit. That's when we're looking at around about a 9.5% gradient. Armel Moinard here is pulling himself inside out to try and stay with these two riders. A Belgian rider and a Dutch rider setting the tempo in the mountains. It's Mario Ertz on the front, Koos Murenhout in second position. And I know that uh, Axel Merckx, probably watching this over in Canada, is sitting right on the edge of his seat because he's a big buddy of the man in the orange jersey there, Murenhout. Well, Moinard has just got to get himself over this very steep section. He might recover from this, and he's going to struggle and try and hold on to these. But Ertz looks very, very cool right now. Remember, he came up to the side of Murenhut. These three riders dictating the pace. If anything, they pull slightly ahead to the 347 now, as there is a little bit of chaos. Team Sky are still setting the pace at the front, or is this another group? This is Saxo Bank now. Oh, they let part, Team Sky start to fall apart. Now they've decided, right, you guys have done a little bit of a job on the front end of the main field. We'd like to show you just now how Team Saxo Bank can do the pacemaking, because we're going to try to do something to set up our man Andy Schleck. Schleck is the best young rider in this race. He was second overall last year and I just remember him saying when he looked up at Alberto Contador on the top step of the podium saying you know what I'd like to be there one day well looking at the back here Chavanel has got all his quick step team around him here but it looks as though he's going to drop away here well maybe the acceleration came with the change of team on the front Saxo Bank starting to tap out the rhythm as again they're using just a fast pace if you've got the strength you'll hang on otherwise you'll lose nobody's attacking they're just riding fast tempo. Yes, but I remember what Sylvain Chavanel said yesterday, Phil. The slopes of the climb yesterday suited him. Those gradients were 4 to 5%, and you can climb those gradients with a big gear. To climb these gradients at 9.5%, 10%, you've got to use a smaller gear and suppleness, and that's not the kind of pedaling style that Sylvain Chavanel has. So as we got to the steeper part of the climb, I think it really started to uh, eat into his energy levels. Alberto Contador currently just sitting at the front end of the main field. He's nice and comfortable so there we are at the back of the field now everybody's scrabbling to hold wheels just at the minute now look at the length this is the area where as Paul said it is the steepest at this tunnel point it really kicks up it's around about eight nine or ten percent the slope on the gradient and the boys are going to lose ground on each other here best place Frenchman last year Christophe Lumavelli attached yesterday on the climb today he's in difficulty he's trying to survive he's trying to keep himself in this bike race but it's not working no, it is not working, and it is proving to be a very, very difficult climb indeed, as we've got the Saxo Bank team right on the front here. Five kilometres to go for them now, and the white jersey of Andy Schleck has moved up as well. The Sky Boys are still penetrating the head of the chase. The peloton is reducing in number. The, oh, the turquoise jersey there of the team of Alberto Contador. Here comes the yellow, and he's losing ground. Now, he has time on his side, but not a lot. 
No, he started the day with a good buffer over the second-place rider, Cadell Evans, at a minute and 25 seconds. He has to get himself into a zone here where he doesn't lose too much time over the top of this climb and takes risks on the descent to try and keep in contact. So Saxo Bank now on the front here. You can see that's Thomas Lovquist in second position. Well, they're uh, slipping back now as well. This is Yanis Brakovic, uh, the winner of the Criterium de Dauphiné, in the same area as where this race is taking place today. And he is in a spot of bother too, and he's slipping off the back end of the main field. So it looks like Levi Leipheimer is there, swinging off now. Well, it sounds as if Lance Armstrong is having a little bit of a problem too, and it appears as if he is being dropped as well. There he is. Riding alongside him uh, is Chris Horner, so Armstrong, I wonder if it's uh, the fact that he was uh, on the ground a little while back or if it's just the acceleration of this climb that is damning the American off the back end of this group. Armstrong in a serious spot of bother, still with four kilometres to go to the stop of this climb. Well, Armstrong now looking down, and who knows whether it's uh, the condition, who knows whether it's the accident. Uh, that's something we will only be able to answer a little bit later on in the day, but I did notice that uh, sitting alongside him there is Chris Horner. Levi Leipheimer is placed in that group a little bit further forward, but now that they've seen that, you've noticed that Team Astana have come to the front, and they are now putting down the hammer. They are laying down the law. Well, uh, the peloton is going to pick up this pace now, and it's going to continue to be destructive to all of the riders. Armstrong really had no time to recover from that chase back, and he's paying the price right now. They're, amazingly, the leaders are going away. It's now four minutes for the leaders, uh, as the infighting has become much more concentrated on the peloton itself. Well, they've got themselves into their groove, the leading group of three riders, and uh, Mario Ertz and Kusmer and Hauter just tapping it out, so sharing the pacemaking at the front end of the main field. Ertz is currently the man on the front, and he's uh, putting his hand out. He probably knows there's a number of Belgian supporters here, and he's looking for a nice ice-cold bottle of water to pour over his head and shake him out of this pain barrier. Well, he's looking pretty strong right now. Well, I say he's going ahead. He's not going ahead of the Contador Schleck uh, group because, of course, they're in between the yellow jersey now. They've dispatched the yellow jersey off the back. He's losing ground. These boys are struggling. One Art has done really well to recover from that steep sector of the course as he's now got himself back into this. The flag of Luxembourg flying there. They'll be looking for Frank Schleck, who is in the white jersey as he's coming up in that main part of the front end of the peloton. They're making their way past the, the little uh, dam just at the top end of the uh, Col de la Ramaz. They've got a very good chance of surviving down towards the start of the final climb of the day out of Morzine up to Avorias because they're not too far away. Team manager coming up alongside here, Franz Masson, to give them a little bit more information and encouragement to say, guys, we can get over the top of this climb and we can survive a little bit longer. But the men now putting the nail into the coffin of Lance Armstrong are his former teammates from Team Astana. We are climbing steadily now up to 1,600 metres. That's where we'll top out today. When we go over the top, there'll be 35 kilometres to race, so we're around about three kilometres or so from the summit. These boys are hanging on in there at the back, and it's interestingly to see, the Paul, that we do have Andreas Cloden here, number 24, for Radio Shack, and we must presume that somewhere up near the front is Levi Leipheimer. Well, this is the group Armstrong coming out of the tunnel. Over on his left-hand side is Chris Horner. Horner is pacing him. Uh, Chris Anker Sorensen is in this group, but just uh, bouncing around uh, with his uh, he helmet over to one side. A bit further back now, this is also Alexander Vinokurov, who seems to be in a spot of bother. Well, Vinokurov also being dropped here now. Luis Leon Sanchez, uh, he's suffering too. He was one of my favourites to do a good ride this afternoon. This is Andreas Cloden. He wears number 24, a former podium finisher in the Tour de France. That group now at the front end of the main field is slowly but surely getting smaller and smaller, and it's now because of the pacemaking of Team Astana. There's the Armstrong group, so Armstrong is currently actually only looking at around about a 15-second deficit. He still has the ability and the chance to recover, and I do remember that Lance Armstrong is a fairly good descender, so take a few risks on the descent, and he might get himself back into this race. Well, Paul, as we're seeing Armstrong lose ground here, are we seeing a change of leadership of the team on this climb? Because Leipheim is still in front. 
Well, Leipheimer is still in front. Armstrong here has got Chris Horner alongside him. He's actually only looking for about 35 seconds on the group just in front of him. Bear in mind, Armstrong is a good mountain bike rider. He's also a very good descender. So if he can just stay in contact towards the top of this climb, take a few risks, he could get himself back into the group on the descent. But you just might have noticed there, Levi Leipheimer in about fourth or fifth position, looking pretty comfortable. But he wasn't involved in the crash, so he went to the mountain as fresh as you can go to the mountain on the stage of the Tour de France. Armstrong didn't have time to take too many deep breaths before the pressure went on. It was applied by Team Sky and Wiggins taking a drink there. Looks very, very comfortable right now. So too does Cadell Evans just behind Levi Leipheimer just sitting there. He was involved in a crash and an accident a little earlier. There's the white jersey on the shoulders of Andy Schleck looking over his shoulder to ascertain who's in the group, who's missing from the group and what they need to do now. Chris Horner in the third group on the road with Lance Armstrong is pacing the man who's won the Tour de France on seven occasions. Started this year dreaming of winning the race for an eighth possible time, but he's had so much bad luck throughout the whole of this race. Well, the situation now is we've got those three riders up front who are trying to go away to win the day. Armstrong has been detached here from the group containing his prime rivals in the event. Leipheim has stayed with that group. There is a chance, Paul, that Armstrong will ride sensibly here, not go too deep into his red zone and recover. Do you remember going back in the Tour de France to an ascent during the Alps over the uh, Jus plan for Lance Armstrong where he hadn't eaten properly and all of a sudden he cracked, he kept himself calm, he didn't panic at all and he rode himself back into the Tour de France on that occasion on a day when he could have lost it. We're not too far now away from the summit of the first, first category climb of the Tour de France this year. Once they go over the summit they will plunge down into the valley below and down towards the town and the valley of Léger before then dropping down to Morzine and starting the final climb of the day. Well, Alberto I... Contador doesn't look too bad, does he? I know, and neither does Cadell Evans, who bounced on the road pretty heavily at six kilometres today. He knows the man he wants to mark. These two have gone through their career as pretty much very close rivals in the world's major stage race. And it's usually come out a win for Contador, but Evans believes he can beat Contador given the right chance. Now, Armstrong is still a couple of kilometres to climb, but he does descend quickly, and it is a long descent as we head down towards Leger. So at the moment, it is Evans and Contador who will look best placed, along with Andy Schleck and Leipheimer of the contenders. We've unshipped uh, Lance Armstrong. He is behind. Wiggins is in that peloton as well. So for those boys, it's still going according to plan. No, Andy Schleck is the man making uh, the very good operation here because he's sitting in that group and watching everybody else do the pacemaking. But Astana have seen this as a possibility to eliminate Lance Armstrong for the race here this afternoon, and they're putting everything they can into this operation to try and gap Armstrong, the man from Texas. But Armstrong currently, Phil, is only looking for 40 seconds, and I know from a fact a man like Sean Yates, for example, can pull back a minute, a minute and a half hey, on the descent. We don't often see those ball. That's a wild ball that's picked up here. And he must be wondering what all these people are doing up on his area, but he's never seen people before. As he runs away, though, the Radio Shack boys, it looks like Brakovic has come up as well to try and give a helping hand just to keep Armstrong in contact with the main group as they might be able to chase it down on the long descent down towards Leger, where there is a third category climb out, and then we get to Morzine. But well, Armstrong, uh, looking at his face there, Phil, does not look that bad at all, and it could well just have been the acceleration over the steeper gradient that put him into difficulty. But when you look at the size of that group that is here, a man like Armstrong, if he was thinking about winning the Tour de France for an eighth time, really should have been present with that group. Yes, but he's had the bad luck again, coming at the uh, bad moment on the race, a couple of K before the climb. 1K for these three boys. They're going to make it over the top, that is for sure. And that is what they want, because the battle behind is a personal one amongst the contenders for final victory in the Tour. If they catch these, they catch them. If they don't, they won't be over-worried about it. So there's a chance that these two riders can push on. Well, that's what they want to do. They want to keep the advantage as much as possible over the top end of the main field and then conserve on the descent and hope they can survive on the final climb of the day. And that's going to be a tall order. It looks like Vinokurov has recovered Phil and pulled himself back into this group. Bradley Wiggins in the black jersey of Team Sky there looks very comfortable indeed just sitting there in the group. The hand was up there from the other Sky rider, Thomas Lockvist. I guess he wants a drink as well. We're going further back down behind that group again to find what we're calling the group Armstrong. 
Oh, Song, uh, one of the big uh, time favourites of the tour, who has lost his position in that group. The only one at the moment, we have to say. All the rest are still in it. Behind Armstrong is the Mayo Jean of Chavanel, and he's not enjoying the ride ever since we got to the steep section. Well, just as a brief reminder, if we stop the race right now, the new overall leader of this bike race would actually be Cadell Evans, yep. because Cadell Evans started the day in second place overall with a one minute, 25 minute, one minute, 25 second deficit on Chavanel. So currently, Cadell is looking like he's the virtual leader, but we've still got one very difficult climb to go. Yes, but they're saying this one is the real battle. It's a very different climb to the climb up to Avoriaz. Avoriaz is in the woods for much of the way, plateaus near the top. We're in exposed conditions here, and the wind is very, very strong today. Wasn't much blowing at the start. The heat itself probably not a major factor at this moment in time, but we are getting up into the mid-70s right now. And it looks along one yard. It's just going to ease off here. They're giving it to the strong man, I think, Paul. Mario Ertz is going to go over the top in first place. Well, about uh, 390 metres to get to the top, and Mario Ertz is riding extremely well here this afternoon for Omega Farmer Lotto. And in the group behind, in fact, uh, they've got a man who could create a bit of a surprise for Belgium as well, because Jürgen Vandenbroek, who started the day in seventh place, was looking quite comfortable in that group of uh, contenders behind. Over the top of the Col de Laramez, almost quarter of a kilometre to go for these riders. Now, one hour, he'll descend well, he'll rejoin, and he's not going to throw too much energy to the wind here. Mario Ertz used his strength to get back up to uh, Kuss. He's done that, and he's going to take the points at the top. No, he'll take points. Uh, this will be 15 points as a first category climb over the summit here. A huge crowd turning out to see the top of the Col de Ramez. And then we are going to be faced now with a very tricky and technical descent on the way down towards the town of Leger, which is a very interesting little ski resort down in the valley below. Lovely little town. We're plunging down into the valley. And again, there's only one way out of Leger, and it's up the mountains. Mario Ertz, Kus out and Wanya. They are the first three over the top. The descent begins for them. There's a very, very elite, a very small bunch of riders coming up now. And they've been torn apart by the pacemaking of Astana. And that was the big question before the Tour de France. How good was Contador's Astana team? They're delivering their answers now. 191, Denny Menchov, the man that a lot of people have talked about as a, a silent contender here, the silent killer his nickname is in the sport because he never gives anything away when he's in a group like this. Moving up the outside of the group, there was Andreas Cloden looking very comfortable in the group as well. Levi Leipheimer, Bradley Wiggins, and nearly all of the pre-race favourites, the pre-race contenders except one. One man missing from that group is Lance Armstrong. This is Christoph Ribler on the left of our picture, the survivor of the breakaway with their VT. They're both going to be swept up now. They were originally in that seven-man escape. We're only 33 kilometres, a shade over 20 miles from the finish, but, of course, there still remains two climbs to get there. Well, the group is uh, fairly large at the moment, Phil, and I wonder if they will really insist on the descent as we go a little bit further back. There's Horner, Brakovic and Armstrong. They're looking for around about uh, 45 seconds on the group containing all of the other pre-race leaders. And, of course, let's not forget that the man who started the day in third place overall, Ryder Hazedal, is still in that group as well. Well, that's a sad picture indeed. Armstrong they're in trouble there because Horner looks as though he's holding back to stay with Lance Armstrong. This is Anthony Charteau. And he's trying to have a little dig for the King of the Mountain points here as he heads up there. 32 kilometres to go. The peloton continually thinning out and they're racing for the small points left on the King of the Mountains. I think that was Raphael Valls who's just gone over and he will have got uh, fourth place, I think. And he's the rider who finished in uh, second place on the stage yesterday. Now we'll get a chance to have a gap here. That's a 2.10, who is the time that the Astana squad went over the top of that group. And now we'll get a, an honest time check back to the group of Lance Armstrong and Chris Horner. But looking back down the road there, Phil, it already looks like a big gap. I think it is a big gap because the group Armstrong is not climbing that quickly and the leaders are. And it will be opening up all of the time here. Brakovic staying with Lance Armstrong here. As Armstrong really is not wanting to live through these pictures right now. He never had a chance today. He never recovered when they got him back into the race because Team Sky really applied the tourniquet as soon as the, as the mountain started. Still a little way to go up the plateau here to the summit. 
Well, he's going to have to take some serious risks on the descent if he wants to pull himself back into this Tour de France because it was two minutes and ten seconds, the time gap on the uh, chases when they went over the top. And I would make it around about the one-minute mark. Just coming up to the top there, three... 3.10 probably for this group, so Armstrong looking to make up a minute on the descent. Now, it all depends on how that group with the Astana riders setting the tempo at the front decide to attack the descent. A minute is very, very possible to make up on this descent. It's quite a long descent before we start the climb in Leger. Uh, so he does have a chance to get very close here again, but will he recover for the next climbs which will be delivered at him? So three riders are clear, and the bunch have come down to around about 20, and that's all. The flags are flying, there is a wind blowing today, it's been mostly tail at the top of the Col de Laramaz, but these riders here now trying to reform the yellow jersey, is over four minutes behind the front of the race, there's a lot of work to be done now, the Mayo Jean may be going up in smoke. Well, it may well be going up in smoke because he's still got another big climb of the day. He's dropping down into the valley. The next climb was just a third category climb, the climb up towards the ski resort of Leger, down into the valley again of Morzine, and then the final climb of the day, the climb up to Morzine of Voriaz. And the way the race situation is, we've still got the three leaders, Ert, Moana and Murenhout, who are doing a phenomenal ride, Phil, because they lead the yellow jersey group, well, the new yellow jersey group, I should say, the contenders group, at 2 minutes and 13. The Armstrong group is at 3 minutes and 10, but unfortunately for the yellow jersey at the start of the day, yeah, Sylvain Chavanel, he's around about four and a half minutes behind. Armstrong's group is actually closing in and trying to get back into the bunch. The three leaders have just begun the four-kilometre climb of Leger now. This is a three-year third-category climb. As they see their 25 kilometres to go, they have a chance, and they must stick to the guns, these three, today, because there's such a, an in-battle going on behind. Now, Armstrong went over the top of the uh, Laramez, a full minute behind the group Schleck Contador Wiggins. He's closed that down and he's hopefully going to get back just in time to do it all again. Ouch, that's a real hurt. And now uh, we're looking a little bit further back. Now, this looks to me as this is Alexander Vinokurov who's going off the front end of the main field. Now, that's not necessarily a good tactic for Team Astana. Well, he's freewheeled off the front. He is a very, very good descender, Alexander Vinokurov. We saw on the climb. He was in trouble, but he came back just after the top of the climb, and now he's freewheeled off the front. Well, bear in mind, Phil, at the start of the day, Alexander Vinokurov was ahead of Alberto Contador in the overall standings by nine seconds, and I've always said that Alexander Vinokurov is a, is a bit of a loose cannon sometimes, and maybe once he sees himself get off the front end of the main field, he might start to think, hmm... Yellow jersey on the horizon for me? Well, I, I, th I would see that advantage Contador if Vinokurov got the yellow jersey. And it, I think it's a clever move by Astana uh, because everybody would still look to Contador while they had Vinokurov in yellow, take all the pressure off the other man. This might be a very, very crafty move by Astana to try and switch attention. And Vinokurov just checking out where they are, whether they're going to come for him or whether he's got a chance to dig in here and go for it. For the leaders, they're 24 kilometres, that's about 15 miles from the finish. Most of it now is uphill. We'll climb to the top of Leger. It's a nice little descent into Morzine. It's a beautiful town. There are thousands of people waiting to see the riders. And then we're up the mountain. Well, you're right, Phil. That does, in fact, take the pressure off Team Astana and a little bit off the shoulders of Alberto Contador because it forces everybody else to come to the front and do the pacemaking. That looked like Anthony Chateau from the helicopter. I'm not quite sure where he was. This is the start of the third category climb. We're into the valley, and this is Chateau coming across to Vinokurov now, wow. and they're starting the third category climb of Leger. It's only a climb of about three kilometres. That's right, and it's not a terribly steep climb, but it is a third category climb, which means there are points for the mountains for the first six over the top as the clock starts counting out now there's the 20 kilometers to go that's for the main pack today Armstrong is behind this group Levi Leipheimer is in it it might mean that Leipheimer is now becoming the captain of the Radio Shack team today it all depends on where Armstrong finishes up the mountain at the end
Well, it's still a very big group. This is Roman Kruziger, one of the leaders of Team Liquigas, so sitting in the group as well. The orange jersey on the shoulders of the Russian rider, Denny Menchov. He's just sitting there comfortably, keeping a close eye on affairs. But that is, Phil, a very large group of riders still, and I wonder if just... getting back all the time. I wonder if just uh, sending Alexander Vinokurov off the front line, that is really going to throw the cat amongst the pigeons on Team Astana. Well, this uh, uh, there, there is the start. They've seen the start of the climb there for the Armstrong group. Sorry about the way the pictures are uh, locking up occasionally, but uh, Armstrong is now on the climb as well. So uh, he has closed in, but unfortunately, he's now got on the climb, and that's not going to ease now because the boys up front are going to go quicker. Well, the time check, in fact, is still showing uh, a gift, a difference between the Schleck Contador group and the Armstrong group at uh, around about the one minute margin, so it looks as if yeah. over the final few kilometres of the descent, Armstrong and his group lost a little bit of time. Back with the leaders here, Kus Murenhau now keeping himself nice and concentrated, ahead of Mario Ertz and Amel Lemoyne, and they're still holding on a two minute advantage over the group of Contador and his teammates. Well, Kus Murenhau uh, will be 37 years of age in November this year. He's been a terrific cyclist, turned pro back in 1996, and he looks really cool out there today. He has started the springboard from the breakaway. These two have joined him. They're still looking very, very good on this climb. We're looking here at the leaders of the tour. They've just topped over the climb of Leger. Next up, Morzine, and then the climb of Avorias. These three riders are still more than hanging on. They're riding extremely well at the moment, and it looks as though they might be able to at least make the start of the climb. The chase behind one rider trying to get up and across, which is Anthony Chateau. But this is where the interest lies now. Team Astana, Alberto Contador's team, have taken command of the chase. Uh, that's uh, Alexander Vinokurov with the jersey open there. That's uh, Jesus Hernandez in the group as well. This is the next group on the road, and it looks as if they're about to uh, raise the white flag here because so. the chase is certainly not organised here. And maybe they're just going to wait and see how they can survive on the final climb of the day. These are not happy days for the Radio Shack boys, and in particular Lance. He never had a real chance today. He lost time on the cobbles because of a punch at the wrong time. He got a crash this time just as the race really begun in the Alps. He's still a kilometre to climb there to the summit. These boys are well over the top and they're heading down towards Morzine. Now wait till you see the people waiting to see the Tour de France in Morzine. This is Chateau trying to reach the leaders. He comes up to the top. Well, Chateau is looking for around about a minute and 40 seconds on those uh, three leaders. He's going to have to take some serious risks on the descent down into town, and he has the ability to ride across the gap. And I tell you what, Team uh, B-Box Boy Telecom is a team that is looking to get themselves into a situation where they can try and get a stage victory. Well, they've got a little uh, second lease of life back in that chase group, which is running about 1 minute 15 seconds behind this main pack of riders. Bradley Wiggins, I've seen in this group, Paul, he's never looked in any trouble at all. And he'd be looking for the move, which has got to come now from Alberto Contador, the way these boys are riding. Cadell Evans, although he's covered in cuts today after his crash, is still looking good and waiting too. Well, there's still a rider in there for Saxo Bank looking after the interests of uh, for Andy Schleck. There, in That's fact, the other rider who's in there as well for Team Omega Pharma Lotto is uh, Daniel Moreno, and he will be looking after the interests of Jürgen Vanderbroek, who started the day in ninth place in the overall standings, and he'll be looking to move a little bit higher up. Well, the Astana boys have... Uh... They were said they may not be strong enough to help Contador win the Tour, forget that. These boys have come here to ride for Contador, he is riding superbly. There he is, fourth wheel, you can always see him in those gold rim sunglasses. He just sits there and he's pedalling fast again. He's coming up towards the summit. This is Vinokurov driving on, the strong man who's back in the Tour de France. Well, if you uh, get a glance to look at Contador, Contador, he's smoothing very pedally. He's pedaling very smoothly, I should say. Armstrong sitting a fair way back down the group now, letting other people do the pacemaking. He's got Yanni Brakovic just behind him. He's riding a different machine. He crashed earlier on. His saddle was ripped off his bike when they went through the small town of Anma. Oh, another crash in the middle of the road. Oh, dear me. And that's almost, that stopped Armstrong again. This well, is not his day. This is unbelievable. A straight road, and he can't believe it. This time he just cannot believe that that has happened. Armstrong just walks away. Well, this is the Tour de France. It's his 13th Tour de France. 
and you never see a crash at a situation like that until well, today. Well, until today, the two riders going down there from Muscadel, Uskadi Armstrong just uh, walks away from that. I don't think he can believe the amount of bad luck that he's had in this year's tour. When Lady Luckfill is not on your side, she's departed. Well, I don't know what Lance said to her, but he must have insulted her. She's left him today. This is unreal. And now he's telling the situation back to the team. He's swathed in bandages here. This is no way to treat a man who's won the tour seven times. But he's not going to get back today. He's going to finish up with a big deficit at the top of Avorias. Uh, well, the team leadership of Radio Shack today moves across to Levi Leipheimer, who is still up there in that front group. They always kept Levi as the second gun, and they made sure he never lost time, and they're proving to be wise now. Yeah, it's a pity, in fact, that Andreas Cloden lost some time yesterday because he plummeted down the standings. He's uh, about six minutes behind in the overall standings at the start of the day, but Armstrong not looking very happy with his Tour de France this afternoon. Well, I think we all feel a little bit sad because that is no way for a champion. That really isn't, but we're looking back now. The group here, again, this is the yellow jersey group. They're not too far behind Armstrong because there they go through there. Sylvain Chavanel, though, the yellow jersey will be off his shoulders tonight at the moment. It looks as though it might go to the Australian Cadell Evans, but, of course, we don't know what's going to happen on the climb of Avorias today. Well, Yanni Brakovic, number 22, the winner of the Criterium de Dauphiné in this very area of France almost a month ago, has dropped back to wait for Armstrong. And uh, the youngster on the squad riding his Tour de France for the first time is going to have to now try and talk the leader, uh, the former master of Radio Shack, uh, back into the racing, the racing mentality that he needs to finish this race. Heading to Morzine now. So, Tête de la Course, the three leaders at 16 kilometres to go, that's 10 miles of racing, but of those 10 miles of racing, around about 13.6 kilometres, which is uh, around about nine miles of racing, is going to be uphill. 15 kilometres to go, banner for these riders. Picking their way now through the outskirts of Morzine, dropping down into this town, which is a very well-known ski resort. It's a ski resort that uh, is the base for a ski resort that goes up to two and a half thousand metres in altitude. There's 150 kilometers of skiing slopes in this part of the world 97 kilometers of ground is used for cross-country skiing it really is an interesting part of the world in the summer they actually open up the ski piece for mountain biking you see by people taking their mountain bikes up the sides of the mountain and they come down like maniacs so here's the final sprint of the day into the town of Morzine one kilometer to go for the three leaders and they're still holding on to around about a minute and 40 seconds advantage over the Contador, Vinokurov, Schleck and Leipheimer group. Well, the boys are into Morzine and Morzine itself now. You'll see the crowd again. They're not going to worry about this little spin for 400 euros down here. They're, they're really concentrating now as they approach the final climb. I told you there were a few people waiting for the race, didn't I? As they go down now, they'll switch round onto the Route d'Avorias and that's a 14-kilometre slog to the summit. If they could just see round to the right, they would probably see the chalets on the mountain. But the way the road goes, it's an awful lot further. Well, to give you an idea, the steepest part of this climb, Phil, is in the bottom, and it's around about 7.5%. But nearly all of the climb is a constant 65 to 7.5% gradient. There is no forgiveness in this race at all until they get up to the final kilometres. But Armstrong now feel pretty much out of this. Look at that. A minute and 37 to the uh, group of the main contenders. Armstrong now is looking at around about four minutes in arrears. Well, the man who took it there just accelerated ahead was Murunut ahead of Mario Ertz and uh, Armael Wanar. The peloton are now making their way into Morzine. This is the main pack of riders here. Chateau's been put back in his place. And he's now on the tail of the peloton. Well, he tried to get himself across the gap. Uh, confirmation of the sprint, uh, Murunhout, Ertz and Wana over in the first three places. Team uh, Astana doing a phenomenal job here, but what's happening now, there's a lot of riders, Phil, starting to queue up behind Alberto Contador with a view to possibly challenging him on the final slopes of the climb. One man who has to pay serious attention is sitting in about eighth or ninth position, and that is Cadell Evans, because on this group, Cadell Evans is the highest place in the overall standings. And this is a climb the majority of the race will not know what it's like unless they took time out to come and visit it in the winter or in the early part of the summer. It's only the third time in tour history we've ever climbed this mountain as a road race. 
and the first time was back in 1975, the first year that Eddie Merckx was beaten in a Tour de France, and it was on this climb where he was in a spot of bother as Bernard Tevin and they put the pressure on, which eventually led to victory in Paris. It's a great climb, and the crowd have got baited breath. Well, it's a great climb if you're watching it at home, uh, sitting in the armchair in front of the television. It's not such a great climb for the guys in that group there because they are going to have to do some serious battle on the slopes of Avoriaz. So there they go now, massing at the front as they pass through the sprint point in Morzine. Looking there now at all of the faces, very, very serious faces. Andy Schleck in the white jersey. He took it away from Geran Thomas yesterday, and Geran Thomas already out of this group today. Emmanuel Erviti, one of the riders in that leading break of seven riders this morning, he's going off the back end of this group, and that's not really a surprise because this has been a long, hard day in the saddle for him, but it's still, Phil, I would have to say, a very large group in the early kilometres of the call up to Avoriaz. Well, they're about three and a half kilometres onto the climb. It kicks a little bit, though. Once we get rid of all the houses and the buildings, it starts to go a bit steeper. Support on the road for the Copa East rider, Christophe Kern. And uh, here we're looking at the Mayo Jean, Silman Chavanel. It looks as though we're looking at the point when he might have said, enough is enough, and he's just going to ride home now. Alexander Kuczynski, the rider alongside him, the champion of Belarus, riding for Team uh, Liquid Gas. A little bit further down the slopes now, uh, Yanni Brakovic riding his first Tour de France, and stamping out the tempo for Armstrong, who is yet to start the final climb of the day, the Col d'Avoriaz. Well, three, uh, three minutes and uh, 18 seconds back on Contador now, Lance Armstrong. Brakovic here doing his job as the young domestic now, but he knows that they can't really drag Armstrong any closer now. It's a matter of just ride home. Ten kilometres to go. These are the three men up front. Are they going to make it? Well, forget the time checks on the yellow jersey. He's not going to catch up. But where is that man talking on his radio? When's he going to catch up? And look at the poker face on Cadell Evans. Well, I don't know if you noticed, it was only a quick uh, notice there, but the man in that group with Armstrong, in fact, was Igor Martinez of Uskatel Uskadi, a former teammate. Fulskang, he's disappearing from this group, having done his job for the day for Andy Schleck. Yeah, and a good job he's done too. He's tried to keep uh, a lot of pressure off Andy, but at the end of the day, that's why he's the team leader. It's all down to Andy now. He's left in the bunch to fend off. It'll soon be the leaders, the only men who have all of the ability to win a Tour de France, who'll be left up front. Just looking in the group there to see if I can see the uh, AG2R rider from Ireland, uh, Nicholas Roach. He was starting off this day in a uh, very high position in the overall standing. He was sitting in eighth place and riding a very good race. He was hoping today to finish in the top 10 to 15 places on the stage and maybe possibly get to Paris in the top 10. Well, if you see him before we do, he wears number 81 and he is having an extraordinarily good tour. This is his second Tour de France. He rides for Team AG2R. They do have two riders in here, so I'd be very surprised if one wasn't Nicholas Roach. Ten kilometres to go for the immediate chase. Well, they're looking for a minute and 11 seconds, Phil, on the leading trio of Ertz, Mwanad and Murenhut. And uh, now they're still doing the pacemaking, all the lumps on the shoulders of Team Astana. I am sure that Team Astana are trying to set something up for Alberto Contador, because the best way to knock out your teammates is to go out and get a big win, an emphatic win on the first serious mountain stage, which is what this one is today. Well, as we're sticking with Roach at the moment, Paul, the rider at the back here is Riblon. He was in the original break and he's just hanging on. Another rider is John Gadre. So they were the two I saw. Let's hope there's a third in the form of Nicholas Roach. A wry smile there for a moment on the face of Lance Armbrong to say, well, I know it's not going to be this year and it's not going to be next year because next year I think will be the, high, the, the Hawaii Ironman towards the end of the season because I don't think we'll see Armstrong back at the Tour de France again. I don't think we will, but he's still going to give it his best shot and hang on in there. One thing Lance is not, he's never been a packer of any major race. He's a grit, hard man. Now, there's the yellow jersey. Looks as though he's settling down to a pedal up to Avoriaz now with no further thought of having yellow. It's all gone. Nine kilometres to go. In that group, though, Paul, we do have the Canadian cyclist rider Hazardal for Garmin Transitions. 
He's a big man to be with such an elite group at this stage of the race, but he started the day in third. And as you said, he was only seven seconds off the time of Cadell Evans, and seven seconds is not very much on the slopes of a climb like this. And he would have to uh, jump in front of Cadell Evans at the moment at the top of the climb to get himself the overall lead and be the new yellow jersey. But my gut tells me that we need to expect something to come from Alberto Contador. Alexander Vinokurov went backwards to look after him and stay with him and pace him over the final kilometers of this climb and that's Alexander Vinokurov there sitting in second position the black band is the heart monitors uh, which measures all the statistics that the coaches will look at tonight they'll be going off the Spiktar scale I think just now Vinokurov looks incredibly strong uh, being second wheel there but they are beginning to lose their teammates and Contador is the rider who has this lovely riding side just jumps out the saddle when he feels he's slowing down and dances away and then he sits down again there's Andy Schleck in the white jersey, Brad Wiggins in the black jersey, just peeping into our picture. He's never been in trouble today. The world champion, Cadell Evans, shoulder to shoulder with Andy Schleck. We're looking at what is now the remnants of the peloton. Vinokurov has just gone off the back. Contador has one teammate left, and then is what is going to happen. They are coming up. There's another one just gone off the back. That it must be Luan Leon Sanchez. No, it's, it is Sanchez himself. He's also gone now. There's very few strong men except the favorites left in that group. They're about to come up on the two leaders. In between, just below our picture there, is Joaquin Rodriguez. He went clear. He's chasing the face of Andy Schleck. Looks good. He's just concentrated on his shoulder on the far side. You can see the world champion, Cadell Evans, behind him. Ivan Basso, a little bit further back, Roman Kruziger. Jürgen Vandenbroek, rider Hezerdahl is in this group. They're all looking fairly comfortable. Andreas Cloden lost some time yesterday to drop down in the overall classification. He, too, looks to be under pressure. So, too, is rider Hezerdahl now in the blue shorts there of Team Garmin Transitions. Well, Hezerdahl's a big man to be a mountain climber. He's not got the reputation of a real mountaineer, but he's done really, really well to be here at this stage. Just look how few are left. But it looks as though Hezerdahl is going off the back with Skies. Thomas Lukvitz also dropping off with him as we try to get round the corner and pick round the men whose race today looks to be done a little bit. This is Hezerdahl, and sadly, keep on going, Ryder. He was hoping to be in yellow tonight. He was third overall today. But that means that Cadell Evans now looks to be stepping forward for the yellow jersey, providing he finishes alongside those boys up front. Well, he needs to stay alongside Alberto Contador, but, you know, he started the day with a good one-minute advantage over Contador in the standings, 101 to be exact. The closest man to him in that group, in fact, is Andy Schleck, and he started the day with a 30-second advantage over Andy Schleck, so we could very easily be looking at Cadell Evans climbing into the yellow jersey at the end of the day. Those are the two leaders just surviving ahead of Joachim Rodriguez, who himself, in turn, is just surviving ahead of the group of Contador and David Navarro. Well, this has been a dual battle again over these last two climbs of the day. Joachim Rodriguez, a great climber, this boy, but it's his first Tour de France and he's riding well for Katusha. And here we are, this is Nicholas Roach. He was in that pack, but he's being unhitched again. The Irishman, oh, it's hurting now, but it's nearly over. Come on, Nicholas. Well, there we look, we can see the damage that's being done now. This is a phenomenal race we are seeing here, and a lot of power has been put into this race in the chase by one Daniel Navarro, a teammate of, da of uh, Alberto Contador. He sat on the front of this group, he stamped out a pedal, and what he's done is he eliminated contenders one by one before he's going to wait for Alberto Contador to take up the responsibility on his own. Watch out, though, Phil, for the two riders from Team Liquigas, because that's <laughs> Roman Kruziger and Ivan Basso, and those two riders have got the ability to create a little bit of a surprise Ooh, today. Well, there's a bit of a surprise here. The last desperate throws here from Moignard. He's just got away from uh, Mario Ertz. They shook hands earlier and uh, thought they'd surrender, but he's gone again as he continues to push up. The last moment. There's the shake of the hands, and now Moignard's going on his own. Ertz told him to go. Well, Ertz there, you can see back in the main field, looking over his shoulder, and what he will be doing is he'll be looking for his own teammate, uh, Jürgen Vandenbroek, who is in that group. He's now the leader of Omega Pharma Lotto. He was a teammate last year of Cadell Evans, and look at that. He goes back, he's got a spare bottle, and he hands it over to his teammate, and he'll just try and get to the top of the climb as best he can. Navarro on the front, still doing that pacemaking for Alberto Contador. Behind Contador, it's Schleck. 
behind Schleck, it's Basso in the lime green. Behind them in the white jersey, the world champion, Cadell Evans. Everybody currently pretty much on the defensive. Look at the size of that little group now, but still the men we've always talked about, with the exception of Lance Armstrong, are in that group. And Michael Rogers sitting at the back for HTC Columbia, the man from Canberra. We know he's back in the Tour de France big time now. They're going to make great progress up the overall classification tonight. Two riders in there for Rabobank. Robert Hessink has managed to get himself into this group alongside Denny Menshov, who just sits there. The Russian rider on Team Rabobank, Phil, has not showed any emotion in his face. He's just sitting there, lock solid at the back of this group. Every time somebody is dropped, he just moves around him one by one, slowly, slowly. This is the sad sight. We're going some three minutes at least, and we're not sure how far back down the mountain now. Armstrong just wants to get the day done and dusted now after the crash just before the bottom of the Col de la Ramaz. He fell again in Leger, and now he's just riding home. Moigna, desperate moment. Is, are they going to let this man win? They never let anybody win. Nope, he's done. He's cooked, he's fried, he's been out in the sun for a long time this afternoon. I hate to be the bringer of doom, Phil, but when you mention three minutes, you better multiply that by two because that's the deficit Armstrong has at the moment. He's more than six minutes behind the time of Alberto Contador, who's still sitting there in the slipstream of his teammate, Daniel Navarro. Well, the flag of South Africa flies on the right of the road on the eve of the World Cup in South Africa, where Holland will take on Spain. And Spain could be finding themselves the leader of the Tour de France here. Is that an omen? I wonder. Because we've got now just one man doing an absolutely brilliant job for Alberto Contador. But if I were to watch, I would agree with Paul Schoen. Watch out for Kreuzinger or Ivan Basso. Although Basso, he looks to be hurting. Well, he's just sitting there. He's waiting. Let's not forget he's the winner this year of the Giro d'Italia. The man who's best placed in this group, don't forget, is Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans has a 30-second advantage in the overall standings over Andy Schleck and almost a one-minute advantage over Alberto Contador. I don't think Contador is going to put a minute into Cadell Evans on a stage like this. Armstrong is a broken man in the Tour de France this year. Lady Luck slapped him in the face, I think, one too many times when he went down the final time there on the climb up to the little town of Leger. Both elbows and his knee are bleeding as he comes up towards the top of Avorias. But they planned on this. If it happened, and it has, and their other man, Levi Leifheimer, has lived up to all hopes here. He is in this group, and I think riding extremely confidently. So five kilometers to go now. There is the banner across the road and still Daniel Navarro tapping out the pace at the front. There behind him is Alberto Contador. Behind him, Andy Schleck. Ivan Basso grimacing there. Over to the left-hand side, Cadell Evans on the wheel of Basso and Roman Kruziger. Chill still sitting at the back is Denny Menchoff. Well, look, you can count the stars of the Tour de France now. They're all in this group, and there is no pressure on Contador to do anything, really. Just ride up. He may not even want the yellow jersey. He'll be very happy if it goes onto the shoulders of Cadell Evans. Michael Rogers making great times. Carlos Sastra, the winner in 2008, is also in this group. The whole group, look at the speed that they are climbing. Alp Duez, it is absolutely incredible. at all that uh, Levi Leipheim has played the car for Armstrong, he's still up there. Well, in that group, just to the right-hand side of Armstrong, the man who uh, helped him win the Tour de France on a number of occasions, Egoi Martinez, but this is where the action is at the front end of the race. Alberto Contador is still sitting there. Roman Kruziger and uh, Ivan Basso locked together in the lime green jersey. Cadell Evans is riding himself here, Phil, into a yellow jersey at the end of the day because he's the best-placed rider in this leading group as uh, Alberto Contador looks to be looking across there to see the face of the man who was his teammate just 12 months ago, Lance Armstrong. But Contador still dancing, still waiting. He hasn't yet had to attack at all in this tour. He may well just postpone it and wait till he gets down to the Pyrenees. Well, there's the pursuit, the white jersey of Andy Schleck. He won that jersey last year. He's still young enough to be in that classification again. We've always said he can win the Tour one day. He said he's had white, but he wants that, as he pointed at Chavanel's yellow jersey this morning. 
Well, he's in a position now. He's going to move up the overall tonight as well with Cadell Evans and with Alberto Contador. Who can intrude in that select trio? Well, it's very difficult to find anybody. The Levi Leipheimer is sitting in fifth position there, and it's a good job that he was not sacrificed yesterday on the climb up Wasn't to the Station it? de Russe because he will be climbing oh. serious up the oh. overall classification. Rogers is unhitched here. He's got to dig deep and sprint back on and close the gaps. Every second will count here today. Michael Rogers, and he's just behind the 2008 winner, number 91, Carlos Sastra. Menchop and Gessing are there as well. Well, Daniel Navarro is doing an incredible job at the front here, dictating this pace. Alberto Contador, Phil, is just sitting there, allowing his teammate to do all of the pacemaking. I'm a little surprised that none of the other contenders have had a little dig just to see whether or not Contador is riding well at all this afternoon, but they just seem to be quite happy to sit there and allow him to set the pace. Slower down the yellow, lower down rather, and slow down, I guess. The yellow jersey here of Sylvain Chavanel. The joys and smiles of yesterday now turn into the grimace of the pain of Avorias. This is Bradley Wiggins. We need to look at his face. He's looking as though it's beginning to hurt. Well, it should be. It's nearly over. Three and a half kilometres to go for the leaders. Wiggins started all the trouble today with his team, and he's lived up to it so far. But don't unhitch now, Bradley, because you must not let go of that group in front of you. Well, this is the elastic, it stretches and it comes back together and still Navarro. Let's not forget Daniel Navarro, Phil, won a stage of the Dauphiné in this part of the world and it was a very difficult mountainous stage too and he's still sitting there stamping out his authority on this group and one by one he's eliminating these guys from the back wheel of Alberto Contador and from the back wheel of this bus but still looking fairly calm there in third position. Andy Schleck, he is a great climber, he's biding his time but Ig Wiggins is unhitched. Well, I'll tell you what, Navarro is killing everybody here. He's, I, I don't think Andy is looking quite as good as he was. I think he's looking a little bit stressed right now. Cadell still looks good and Contador still looks good. Yeah, but Wiggins is now gone. He's been slipped off the back of this group. Mick Rogers is yo-yoing as well in the yellow jersey. 1-1-8 at the back. They're on and off this group. He's just hoping to survive and come back and fight on another occasion. This is a doer battle now. and We're going back seven minutes, look. Seven minutes and 14 seconds down. Uh, this is the unfortunate price you pay as having been the star of world cycling for so long the cameras never leave you Lance Armstrong continuing to climb the mountain well he's alone in everything bar company on the side of his bike there but he's, his pl plan B is working so far he still has Levi Leipheimer in this front group so it's not all doom for Team Radio Shack three kilometers to go the hill gets a little bit easier now so Wiggins might come back well, Levi Leipheimer started the day in 17th place overall. He should be climbing up into the top 10 tonight. But you know what? There are still a lot of big challenges in this group. The gaps have not yet really started to appear. Navarro still not going to give up. He still wants to thrash the rest of the riders in this group. And there's no emotion at all on the face of Alberto Contador. I actually, Phil, don't think that Andy Schleck is that bad at all. He's been sitting there. He's been turning a fairly low gear. Cadell Evans is comfortable too. They're all just waiting to see what's going to happen on this day. And it may well be a status quo apart from the elimination of one Lance Armstrong from the pack. The long strip of concrete that leads to absolutely nowhere because when we get into the mud of the chalets, that will be the end of the day today. And then it's in the cars. As the riders go down, we're looking here at the peloton of the Tour de France, the elite peloton of the Tour de France. Wiggins can come back if he can suffer that little bit because the road does ease. Two and a half kilometres to go. This man, Navarro, boy, they're going to look after him in the hotel tonight. They certainly will. Alberto Contador coming up alongside his teammate further, further down the slope. But Armstrong now is just surviving this Tour de France of his. He's riding up to the top of this climb. While Navarro, look at the face on him. He's now going deeply into that level of pain. You can see Contador getting out of the saddle. Schleck now starting to grimace a fraction too but everybody else in this group seems to be staying in contact. At the back of the group, I'm looking to see Mick Rogers there moving up the outside in the black and yellow jersey of Team HTC Columbia. He knows that he needs to be very wary of these final few kilometres in case there are any last-minute accelerations. <laughs> Jürgen van der Broek is comfortably in the group too. For Last year, he was the teammate, let's not forget, of Cadell Evans. Now he's the leader of Omega Pharma Lotto. And he is carrying huge hopes for Belgium. 75% of the market share they're getting on Belgian television because of 
Jürgen van der Broek breaking into the top ten of the Tour de France. Good luck to him. He's right in the group here, doing what he hoped they would do. Little pat on the shoulder from the crowd there for Alberto Contador. But they all need pats today. Look at the face of Evans now. Scored by the accident this morning. He knows what has to be done and has not let that guy in white leave him. Well, there's another man we've not mentioned in this leading group and he's a man from Spain as well, Sanchez. But it's Sammy Sanchez on this occasion, the Olympic champion from Beijing. He's sitting comfortable as you like in that group for Uskatel Uskadi. So here we go, we're still now looking at two kilometres to go and still nobody's made a move, still nobody's made any attempt at all to try and get themselves a stage victory here this afternoon. The face of Ivan Besser there, Phil, in about third or fourth position is a picture of pain. Two kilometres to the finish of a duo battle today. They deserve their rest tomorrow and the mountains get steeper on Tuesday. Look at the faces now. This is so important and look at this now. This is Kreuzinger, the man they should have watched out for. They're going to have to come after him. Well, Kreuzinger made the move there. They've got a big advantage, Team Liqui Gas, because they know they've got two riders in this group. But immediately, Alberto Contador covers the move. Andy Schleck straight across there, and so too Cadell Evans. Cadell Evans, Phil, is riding himself into a yellow jersey at the end of today's stage because he starts the day with a 30-second buffer over Andy Schleck and a one-minute buffer over Alberto Contador. But it's right. all back together. Wait now for the attack to come from Ivan Basso if he's got the legs this afternoon. Well, it's certainly not... Too early for Australia to celebrate the Mayo Jorn back in the camp and back on the shoulders of the world champion. He last wore the Mayo Jorn in 2008 when he finished second in the Tour de France. They can't get the time off him now to stop him getting yellow. And in any case, he's got his braces hooked over the saddle of everybody. He's not going to get dropped. He's hanging on. Is that Guessing going? Yeah, it's Robert Guessing, the man who won a big stage in the Tour of Switzerland. He's got himself the gap. He's a fair way down in the overall standing, so they may not well respond to this move by guessing as he goes off the front here maybe he's trying to wave the flag here for this afternoon <laughs> Phil for for Holland but covered there by Spain it's almost a World Cup final at the top of the climb here it's a World Cup final on bikes here as we see now guessing has been monitored out of this by Sanchez who's got onto his back wheel Contador is there, then comes uh, Andy Schleck, then comes the world champion, Cadell Evans, and now we've got uh, Michael Rogers just slipping into the uh, spot of bother here, he's got to hang deep now. Well, Mick Rogers has got to hang deep and try and keep in contact with this group just in front of him. Almost he can touch the back wheel there of Ivan Basso, but this is now this really now starting to dig deep. This is guessing again coming to the front. He wants a victory for Holland this afternoon, but he's covered by Spain. But this time it's Alberto Contador. And still, Andy Schleck is sitting there. He's locked onto the wheel of Alberto Contador. Watch out for the win this afternoon. I think it may well go to Andy Schleck because he's feeling pretty good. Well, I tell you, we're looking at the bridge, which means. 1,000 meters to the finish. We are witnessing a battle duo here between the greatest climbers in the world. They are all in the pain barrier. There is no one holding anything back. They are really suffering now. It's he who gauges it. One last effort will win the day. Even guessing now has tried and he's still trying, but they're right there behind him. Well, Contador just looks so cool and collected there in second position. He's covered every acceleration. There's the move there by Andy Schleck. Schleck has gone with an incredible look at the reaction by Alberto Contador. And there's a slow reaction. Sanchez, the Olympic champion, has got onto the wheel of Contador. And now and Sanchez is going to go past Contador. He wanted the help. He didn't have it. Andy Schleck is gritting his teeth. This is her brother, Frank. He left lying on the cobbles of northern France with a triple fracture of the collarbone. Olympic champion coming across there, Sammy Sanchez. That's pushed Cadell Evans right to the back of this group with that acceleration. Don't forget, Cadell crashed at the six kilometres. Sammy Sanchez, Beijing in 2008. He was the Olympic champion, he's got Andy Schleck with him, but where is Alberto Contador? He's not able to respond to this acceleration, he's leaving the work, Phil, up to that man there, Roman Kreutzinger. Well, I tell you what, uh, they're going to take a lot of strength from this, as the mountains are only just starting, they found the little hole in the armour of Contador, but there's the counter move, and uh, Contador goes again here, but has Samuel Sanchez done enough at 400 metres from the line, or will Andy Schleck, who started the move, try and sprint by him the pack are together and closing in guessing screws himself to try and get up there now followed by Contador a final kick now this is like the Olympics reborn 
Well, Andy Schleck needs 30 seconds over Cadell Evans if he's going to think about getting himself the yellow jersey at the end of the day, Phil. But I think more interested in him is to try and get himself the victory. Sammy Sanchez has got the sprint. Andy Schleck's coming up alongside him. They're into the finishing straight. But you know, Sammy Sanchez is looking back to see whether or not there's going to be any acceleration from Schleck. The crowd see the Tour de France and Avori has a second kick by the Olympic champion. It's not enough. It just was not enough. Andy Schleck has won the battle today of Avori. As he beats uh, Samuel Sanchez, guessing who started the final throws of the attacks gets third. Fourth will be uh, Kreuzinger, fifth, I think, Contador. And Cadell Evans is the next wearer of the Mayo Jean, and he wears it for Australia. Rick Rogers coming in there at 20 seconds. He held tough over the final few kilometers. This will be Joachim Rodriguez coming in. You can see now that the time gaps, Phil, are going to start to appear in this Tour de France. 38 and a half kilometers an hour is the average speed over this very difficult mountain stage. But Cadell Evans, who faded a little bit towards the end on the stage placings, but he did enough on time to make himself get into the yellow jersey at the end of the day. But the tough man is Andy Schleck. Heijadol dreamed today at the start of it Phil, of getting himself the yellow jersey, but he'll still keep high up in the overall standings. And there, of course, is Andreas Cloden, who T2 will start to climb up the ladder. Good ride by Hegedal here. He's a big man to get up this mountain. He stays high in the Tour de France. It's going to be, I am very sad to say, a long wait for Lance Armstrong tonight after that battle over the last two kilometers by the leaders. They will have opened the gaps to uh, some horrendous distance, I think. But uh, Levi Leipheimer flies the flag for Radio Shack in that group at the moment, getting the same time as the winners today. But that was a brilliant run by Andy Schleck. And, uh, oh, sadly, Sanchez jumped out of the saddle. I think he got crap. He just had nothing left in his legs. Well, I don't think you can hold that against him. And just looking back through the record books, Phil, although uh, Frank Schleck has won stages in the Tour de France before, my gut feeling tells me as Wiggins comes up to the line, that's the first stage victory by Andy Schleck. And look at the gap as Wiggins hits the line. A minute and three quarters lost to the men he's trying to beat here. That's a serious loss when the day seemed to be going so well for Bradley Wiggins from the day they started the moves on the Col de Ramaz. I still think they made a mistake setting that pace on that climb. It should have been left, I think, up to somebody else. Uh, Anthony Chateau crossing the line there, Phil, uh, over two minutes in arrears of Andy Schleck, who today gets himself his first uh, yellow, his first uh, stage victory at the Tour de France and consolidates his lead in the overall standings for the best young rider competition. Well, just take a look at the faces on these riders now. They have suffered like they've never suffered in bike races before today. This is the Tour de France, and that crowd demands pain. Well, the crowd demands pain. They demand uh, showmanship, and uh, this afternoon, uh, Daniel Navarro created some serious showmanship for his own teammate, Alberto Contador. But a lot of riders believe that Contador can be beaten, and one of those riders is Andy Schleck. Andy Schleck made that acceleration. Contador tried to go with that move, Phil, and he didn't have the legs to close it down. He looked for Sammy Sanchez to come and help him, but even Sammy Sanchez accelerated away from Alberto Contador. This Tour de France now is going to start to look rather interesting.